Good morning. Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's public meeting of its Consumer Advisory Board, also known as the CAB, at our headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. My name is Zixta Martinez. I serve as the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the CFPB. Let me spend a few minutes telling you about what you can expect today. First, I'll introduce the CAB members. Then the CFPB's Director, Richard Cordray, will provide opening remarks. Following the Director's remarks, Alice Hurdy and PJ Neary, respectively Principal, Deputy Assistant, and Senior Exam Manager for the Office of Supervision Policy, will lead a discussion with CAB members about consumer reporting. At about 11.30, the CAB will hear from Anthony Alexis, Assistant Director for the Office of Enforcement, Patrice Ficklin, Assistant Director for the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity, and Rebecca Gelfond, Deputy Fair Lending Director for the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity. Tony, Patrice, and Rebecca will lead a review of the Bureau's enforcement actions. actions. At 12.30 p.m., the CAB will participate in a discussion about the CFPB's Open Credit Score Initiative with Yannicka Radcliffe and Maria Hamarillo, respectively the Assistant Director and Program Analyst in the Office of Financial Education. Following this discussion, the CAB will adjourn at approximately 1.15 p.m. At 2.30 p.m., the CAB's chair, Mava Elise Brown, will resume the meeting, and CAB members Chi Chi Wu and James Wayman will lead a discussion about trends and themes in the field. At about 3.30 p.m., the CAB will hear from Darian Dorsey, Deputy Assistant Director for the Office of Consumer Response. Darian will lead a discussion about enhancements to the Bureau's consumer complaint process. The CAB meeting will adjourn at approximately 4.30 p.m. Today's meeting is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov, and you can also follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook. As many of you may know, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which created the CFPB, also provided for the establishment of the CFPB's Consumer Advisory Board to advise and consult with the CFPB in the exercise of its functions and to provide information on emerging practices in the consumer financial products and services industry, including regional trends, concerns, and other relevant information. Today's meeting and discussion is in support of this statutory responsibility. As a reminder, the views of the CAB members are their views and they are greatly appreciated. However, they do not represent the views of the CFPB. So let's get started with an introduction of our CAB members. The chair is Mava Elise Brown. She's the executive director of Housing and Economic Rights Advocates in Oakland, California. The vice chair is Anne Medor. She is the director of the Fair Financial Services Program at Texas Appleseed in Austin, Texas. Sylvia Alvarez is the executive director at the Housing and Education Alliance in Tampa, Florida. Tim Chen is the CEO of Nerd Wallet in San Francisco, California. Lynn Drysdale is the managing attorney of the Consumer Law Unit at Jacksonville Area Legal Aid in Jacksonville, Florida. Kathleen Engel is a research professor at Suffolk University Law School in Boston, Massachusetts. Judith Fox is a clinical professor of law at the University of Notre Dame in Notre Dame, Indiana. Paulina Gonzalez is the executive director of the California Reinvestment Coalition in San Francisco, California. Julie Guggen is the executive director for the Minnesota Home Ownership Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Neil Hall is retired, having previously served as the executive vice president and head of retail banking at the PNC Financial Services Group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
William Howell is the head of U.S. Retail Banking at Citibank in New York City. Brian Hughes is the Senior Vice President and Chief Risk Officer at Discover Financial Services in Deerfield, Illinois. Christopher Kukla is the Executive Vice President at the Center for Responsible Lending in Durham, North Carolina. Max Levchin is the co-founder and CEO of a firm in San Francisco, California. Joanne Needleman is a member at Clark Hills Consumer Financial Services Regulatory and Compliance Group in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Patrick O'Shaughnessy is the president and CEO of Advance America in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Ariane Shuta is the founder and managing partner at Core Innovation Capital in Los Angeles, California. Lisa Servan is a professor of city and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Gene Spencer is the Senior Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement, Policy and Research for the Home Ownership Preservation Foundation in Washington, D.C. Jim Van Dyke is Founder and CEO of Futurion in Pleasanton, California. Raul Vasquez is the CEO of Opportune in Redwood City, California. James Wayman is the Executive Vice President of Scores at the Fair Isaac Corporation in Roseville, Minnesota. Chi Chi Wu is a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Joshua Zinner is CEO of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility in New York City. We also have with us Delicia Hand, Staff Director for the Bureau's Office of Advisory Board and Councils. And this afternoon, we'll be joined by David Silberman, Acting Deputy Director for the Bureau, as well as the Associate Director for the Research, Markets, and Regulations Division. I'm now extremely pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's attorney general. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as attorney general, he also served as an Ohio state representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you, Zixta. <clears throat> Welcome to this meeting of the Consumer Advisory Board. I think I can say perhaps with some feeling that I'm glad to be here uh, today. Uh, we find great value in the dialogue we have with our CAB members who share with us their perspective, their expertise, and their experience. All of that improves our work in many ways. We're here together because each of us cares deeply about how consumers are being treated in the consumer financial marketplace. Today, I want to talk to you specifically about some of the really good work our team has been doing and the tangible progress we're making in the consumer reporting marketplace. Consumer reporting, also known familiarly as credit reporting, is an important market that for many years has not been very transparent and generally is not well understood by consumers. It's also one of the markets where people cannot vote with their feet by choosing another provider if they're dissatisfied, which means the industry incentives and practices are not always aligned easily with the interests of consumers. It is a business-to-business -business ecosystem where consumers traditionally have had little power to insist on improved practices or fair treatment. Nonetheless, the data managed by the consumer reporting companies and the scores generated from that data exert a tremendous influence over the ways and means of people's financial lives. Credit reports on a consumer's financial behavior can determine eligibility for credit cards, car loans, mortgages, and more, and they often affect how much a consumer will have to pay. If a credit re record appears to show a greater risk of failing to repay a loan, then the consumer can be denied any credit at all and likely will be charged higher interest rates on any loan that is actually offered to them. 
In 2012, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau became the first government agency ever to supervise the national consumer reporting companies. Even more than that, the Bureau became the first federal agency to supervise all sides of the credit reporting market, from the consumer reporting companies that collect the information to the various companies that furnish it to them. For the first time, it became possible for a single agency to see across the entire credit reporting ecosystem and hold all of the key parties responsible for issues of data accuracy and dispute handling. No finger pointing could deflate or deflect accountability. Today, we're releasing a report offering more detail on the problems we've uncovered and corrected in the consumer reporting industry through our oversight work over the past several years. It tells a fascinating and eye-opening story. We have pressed the consumer reporting companies to fix data accuracy and repair dispute handling. And we've pressed those who furnish data to clean up the information they're supplying to the consumer reporting companies. Although much more improvement still is needed, we're making real headway. And the importance of this work for the overall welfare of consumers is truly enormous. Before we started supervising the consumer reporting industry, accountability occurred only through sporadic enforcement actions and private litigation. There was no direct and continuing oversight to address the problems consumers had with the industry. Standards on the accuracy of information in consumer credit files were distinctly subpar. For general industry purposes, the data may have been good enough if lenders found it helpful in gauging credit risk, but that rough and ready standard did not work well for individual consumers. Indeed, in 2012, the FTC released the results of a study it conducted on the accuracy of credit reports. It found that at least one in five consumers had an error on at least one of their credit reports, and for one in five of those, the error was sufficiently serious to materially affect their credit score. This translates into many millions of American consumers, something approaching 10 million or so. Consumers also complain about the great difficulties they encounter in getting errors corrected. You may have had this experience yourselves. They often find themselves with little or no recourse if they're stymied or things go wrong. I recall the kinds of stories I heard in Ohio when we were working on credit freeze legislation when I was in state government. Sometimes it took well over a year and people would bring in a shoebox full of the contacts they had had to get any results. And many of those matters didn't re result in any results. They ended in complete failure. Some errors are unavoidable, even in the best of systems, but when consumers find what they perceive to be erroneous information in their credit reports, they should not be burdened by unreasonably laborious processes to get those errors fixed. Yet people continue to tell us just how hard it is for them to get errors corrected. Our latest monthly complaint report, released a few days ago, shows that consumers continue to struggle to resolve errors on their credit reports. As of last month, the Bureau has handled approximately 186,000 credit reporting complaints, with many expressing common issues over time. Having said that, though, we are moving the needle. Five years ago, we first began to conduct on-site examinations to see whether and how consumer reporting companies were complying with the law and whether their practices posed risks to consumers. We've gained a more thorough understanding of their business models and business practices, but most importantly, we began to work with them to correct the many problems we found and to resolve matters that were causing harm to consumers. Until we gained the authority to do this work, to repeat, no state or federal regulator was in position to hold these companies regularly accountable, and none could generate a complete picture of what was happening inside their operations. So we began monitoring and examining them just as we monitor and examine the biggest banks, giving us a clear window into the entire credit reporting system. The companies became subject to review of their compliance systems and procedures through on-site examinations, discussions with relevant personnel, and reporting requirements. This is a very different and much more systematic approach than merely subjecting them to occasional law enforcement actions as had occurred previously. Our approach has been holistic, addressing not just the consumer reporting companies themselves, but also the banks and other financial companies that supply them with data, including mortgages, student loans, auto loans, credit cards, and debts and collection. In 2013, we published a bulletin emphasizing that we would hold furnishers accountable for their obligations to investigate disputes forwarded to them by the consumer reporting companies, and we explicitly noted that they must review all relevant information provided with the disputes, including documents that are submitted by consumers. We had found, interestingly, that that was not the norm. We also continue to educate the public about the importance of checking their credit reports, what to look for, and how to dispute any errors in their reports. 
The approach is in line with our fundamental understanding that the consumer reporting market is not simply a business-to-business -business market as it had been perceived previously. Instead, it is a market that deals with the precious and personal information of many millions of individual consumers with huge impact on their lives. <clears throat> in treating the consumer reporting companies accordingly, our approach has worked a substantial change in their approach and in their outlook for consumers. As outlined in today's special edition of Supervision Highlights, which we're publishing today, our oversight teams have focused their work on data accuracy, repairing dispute handling, and cleaning up information supplied by furnishers. As a report shows in much greater detail, our corrective actions have had a considerable positive impact for consumers. First, in our earlier exams, when we first started supervising the consumer reporting companies for data accuracy, we were surprised to find that their quality control systems were either rudimentary or virtually non-existent. Without strong controls in place to check the accuracy of their records, however, data quality could not be assured. So we directed them to make a number of changes to improve in this area, which they have done. In our more recent exams, we found that quality control programs have now been instituted, which include testing to identify whether credit reports are being produced for the wrong consumers. Many consumers have similar names and there can be a lot of confusion, and whether they contain mixed up files. The companies are also taking better corrective actions when errors are identified and making more systematic improvements to prevent the same errors from happening again. Second, we have imposed extensive corrections to the process for consumers to dispute the information contained in their credit reports. At the outset, we found that these processes were badly broken. Our examiners discovered that one or more of the consumer reporting companies was not following the federal requirement that they must send a notice to consumers clearly stating the results of their investigation of disputes. Our examiners also found that companies were failing even to consider documentation that consumers had provided in some disputed matters. So we imposed specific corrective actions to require the companies to improve their dispute investigation systems. Since we began to focus on this area, we've directed them to do a better job of investigating disputes and providing more complete response letters to consumers. And we're making it a point to follow up on those directives. Third, we're also cleaning up the information that the consumer reporting companies receive from those who furnish it to them. We are all familiar with the data problem of garbage in, garbage out. Through our reviews of both the banks and other furnishers, our examiners found widespread problems indicating that they were supplying incorrect information to the consumer reporting companies and failing to follow an adequate process to correct the information when consumers disputed it. So we directed them to undertake specific improvements, such as maintaining evidence that they're accurately handling disputes and conducting reasonable investigations. As a result of our reviews, many furnishers have recognized the need to dedicate more resources to ensuring the integrity of the data they provide to the consumer reporting companies and to address errors when they're brought to the furnisher's attention. This includes better handling of disputes, notifying consumers of results, and taking corrective action when inaccurate information is found to have been supplied. During our examinations over the past several years, encompassing various kinds of financial institutions, not just the consumer reporting companies, when examiners have found violations of law, they've directed the companies to change their conduct and remediate consumers who have been harmed. In certain instances, as appropriate, the Bureau's supervisory activity also results in enforcement actions, such as the actions recently taken against some of the consumer reporting companies for deceiving consumers about the utility and actual cost of the credit scores that were sold to them. The Bureau has also taken an enforcement action against Wells Fargo as a furnisher for failing to update or correct inaccurate negative information reported to the consumer reporting companies about student loans. This all goes to say that while we make every effort to correct problems through the use of our supervisory authorities, when enforcement action is needed on behalf of consumers, we're willing and able to use that tool as well. Our oversight activity is prompting an entirely different approach to ensuring compliance at the major consumer reporting companies and their data furnishers. We are requiring them to engage in proactive attention to compliance rather than a defensive and reactive approach to the issues raised by data accuracy and dispute handling. We believe this proactive approach will continue to benefit consumers and the lenders that use credit reports because of greater accuracy for many years to come. Another way to help improve the consumer reporting market is to get consumers more directly involved. If consumers begin to demand more, they can compel both the consumer reporting companies and furnishers to become more responsive and responsible to the public. 
This means turning the established business-to-business -business model of credit reporting to focus more squarely on the needs and rights of consumers. In order to make this happen, it's necessary to stimulate even greater consumer awareness of the credit reporting system and how it matters to people's lives. People cannot take control of their finances if they do not recognize how this system exerts substantial influence over their financial choices. We have attacked this problem by championing, joining and championing the Open Credit Score Initiative and related developments, which are aimed at making credit scores and credit reporting information more readily available to consumers at no cost. Years ago, people were given the right to check their credit reports for free with each of the three largest consumer reporting companies and with other specialty companies every year. But credit scores were not made available in the same way, even though seeing one of their credit scores tends to give consumers unique insights into the meaning of all the cumulative information contained in their credit files. And in fact, credit scores are what matter most to many lenders. The Open Credit Score Initiative is now taking on this problem by encouraging industry to continue to expand access to free credit scores and by building consumer awareness of the availability of credit scores and credit reports. It also is helping consumers understand how they can use this information to achieve their own financial goals through expanded educational efforts by a growing roster of consumer lenders and others. Today, we are boosting this awareness by releasing a list of companies that have informed the Bureau that they offer their existing credit card customers free and ready access to one or more of their credit scores. Some lenders have gone further and now offer the same service to all consumers, whether or not they are existing customers. To check out the Open Credit Score company list, go to our website at consumerfinance.gov. If other companies that are providing this service or choose to provide it wish to be added to the list, they can do so as well. What it indicates is that many, many millions of Americans now have free access and, and frequent access to their credit scores. Looking ahead, we will continue our work to hold the consumer reporting companies and furnishers accountable for complying with the requirements of the law and treating consumers fairly. This is a realistic and responsible standard that accords with the important ways this industry affects people's financial lives. Given the tremendous impact of credit reports and credit scores on consumers, we must be sure that the consumer reporting system works well for each individual consumer. We are committed to making further improvements in this market. Our ultimate vision is a consumer reporting market that works efficiently to ensure that access to consumer credit is based on accurate information. <clears throat> we expect consumer reporting companies and furnishers to operate effective systems that identify and correct errors in consumer reports before they are sent to users. <clears throat> These systems will likely combine the quality control, data monitoring, and auditing processes that many companies are in the process of building out now. We believe these changes are creating a much needed system of continuous improvement in data accuracy. We also expect improvements in the market to ensure that consumers have a fair opportunity to have their disputes resolved timely and thoroughly with inaccurate information being corrected. The responsibility to address these inquiries falls on both the consumer reporting companies and their furnishers. Under the law, each must reasonably investigate disputes and clearly communicate the results to the consumer. This requires appropriate investments and system upgrades as they cannot simply pass the buck to one another. And the era of dispute purgatory, where consumers have to spend months or even years making repeated efforts to dispute inaccurate negative information in order to get someone's attention, should become a thing of the past. That is our expectation. At the same time, we and other law enforcement officials will be policing and supporting this market by working to root out scammers and fraudsters. We want to protect consumers against those who peddle false claims, such as when credit repair companies guarantee that negative information, even if it is accurate, will be removed from people's credit files if they just dispute it enough times. The truth is that negative, accurate credit information is unlikely to be removed, and it's best cured by the passage of time and by paying your bills on time. Everyone in the consumer reporting market, including both consumers and providers, will benefit from the work we're doing to strengthen the marketplace against such illegal activity. In short, our oversight work has spurred a great deal of progress by the consumer reporting companies and their data furnishers in the past several years in improving the crucial areas of data accuracy and dispute handling. Nonetheless, there's more to be done to improve these practices, so we look forward to hearing from the Consumer Advisory Board members to further inform our approach. In addition to our work on credit reporting, we will also discuss our recent enforcement work and new steps we're taking to enhance the experience during our complaint process. Uh, and I believe I, I missed a financial education segment that Zixta outlined as well. 
As always, we're thinking hard about these issues, and we're open to your suggestions. Thank you again. Thank you, Director Cordray. And welcome. Okay. Um, sound effect in the background there. And welcome, everybody, to this winter meeting of the Consumer Advisory Board. Thanks. Today's meeting focuses on some very important topics, such as the consumer reporting marketplace, transparency, and increased access to consumers' information through improving access to their credit scores. And the work of the Bureau continues to do, the work that the Bureau continues to do through its enforcement activities to identify and prosecute violations of the law. We know that for most Americans, having accurate information on their credit reports and having regular access to their credit scores uh, is, in, is incredibly important and can be determinative for them in, in many arenas. Uh, credit score can determine how much house or car a person can afford. For some, whether they'll be interviewed for a job. For others, whether they can get utilities or a phone hooked up. The consumer report and resulting credit score is of great significance, so I'm pleased that the Bureau will share with us some of its accomplishments in this space and that it has continued to work with financial institutions to empower consumers so that they have greater control over their own financial well-being. During this morning session, we will hear from Bureau staff about recent updates in this space, and then we will ask CAB members to engage in discussion about these recent findings. I'd like to first invite Alice Hurdy, Principal Deputy Assistant Director in the Office of Supervision Policy and her colleague PJ Neary, also in the Office of Supervision, uh, to uh, better to inform us of some of the great work of the Bureau. And in order to help the public better understand the work that the CFPB is doing through its supervision program. Uh, the Bureau has released a summary report which outlines some of the recent findings in the Bureau's work supervising financial institutions. So, Alice and PJ, please take it away. Good morning. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, and present to the CAB this morning. Director Cordray's remarks, I think, got us off to a great start. And we'll be presenting some more details about the results so far of supervision's work in the consumer reporting market. Uh, presenting uh, with me today uh, is P.J. Neary, uh, as mentioned, a senior exam manager in our southeast region who for over four years has led our team of examiners and field managers at the Nationwide Consumer Reporting Companies. Delighted that P.J. is here. Uh, this slide is our disclaimer that our presentation is our own. Hope you would all agree that this is a clear and conspicuous uh, disclosure. Um, also with us today are members of our supervision team, and I think everyone agrees that uh, any organization's greatest asset is, is the people who make things happen. So uh, in, in the row there, we have Roy Thomas, David Wake, Rebecca Plett, Tony Rodriguez, our office director, Peggy Tui, Tom Oshowitz. I see Jonah Kaplan from the Office of Markets. Uh, there may be other folks from our team uh, who I can't see, but it, uh, it really is a team effort uh, between our uh, tens and tens of examiners, their managers in the field, and uh, the folks in supervision policy, the Office of Regulations. So let's give them a round of applause. Okay. And I would also like to mention, not here is Mark Hodge, field manager in the Midwest region, who, like PJ, is a charter member of our national consumer reporting team in the field. Uh, together with examiners across the country and here, we've obtained these results for consumers and the market. And you all have, hot off the presses, our special edition of supervisory highlights we're releasing today. Uh, that gives both uh, an overview of our most uh, recent results, but tries very much to do a compare and contrast uh, to previous findings that we've put forward. This uh, supervisory highlights is a mainstay now of our public reporting on our work and is in its own way groundbreaking. Every quarter or so, uh, we summarize our findings from our non-public examinations to the extent our confidentiality rules allow which is why you will not see specific institutions 
mentioned because these are still non-public findings. However, we have been able to produce this. Oh, I need to speak more clearly into the microphone. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we are able, though, to summarize at somewhat a high level, but hopefully, and the feedback we've received is that this is helpful for members of the public and for the industry. All previous issues of Soup Highlights are available on consumerfinance.gov under the Policy and Compliance tab. And if you Google it, it comes up quite quickly. So on to slide three, just a, set, uh, a roadmap of what we hope to talk about uh, with you this morning. We'll start with a few words about how CFPB's unique jurisdiction gives us the tools to examine this and other markets. We'll discuss our supervisory approach, which has particular significance in the consumer reporting market. PJ will then provide an overview of supervision's approach at consumer reporting companies, beginning with an overview of the types and timelines of our reviews to date. He'll discuss our results from the data accuracy and dispute investigation reviews most recently conducted. Then I'll detail the work at furnishers and summarize the FCRA and Regulation V violations we've identified and the changes we've directed furnishers to make. So uh, moving to the next slide, this is, uh, I'm sure information you, you know well, our, our, our jurisdiction uh, in our Office of Supervision. And really key to this market, I just wanna highlight from this slide, of course, that we have authority to examine larger consumer reporting companies, larger debt collectors, many of which furnish to consumer reporting companies. And as, as the director noted, uh, the large banks, uh, those with more than 10 billion in assets, they furnish on a variety of lines of businesses, of course, mortgage, credit cards, deposit accounts. We have authority over mortgage servicers, whether that's done at a bank or a non-bank, larger student loan servicers, and larger auto lenders and servicers. So it's a mix of both depository and non-depository market participants. So a few words about our approach in light of that authority, that important authority. This broad lens we have, we have an ability to evaluate the compliance uh, of Fair Credit Reporting Act in particular at a variety of consumer reporting companies as well as many of these institutions that supply the credit information. But our authority and strategy is really, they're just the beginning. Our supervision program truly is brought to life by our examiners across the country in our four regions. They travel week over week, month over month, year over year, to go on site to a variety of institutions. In this consumer reporting market, Examiners conducted on-site reviews at many non-banks that had never before been examined in this way, certainly by a federal regulator. So introducing these institutions to the concepts of supervision while learning from the business line leaders and compliance officers at those institutions has really been the order of the day for us and a challenging one at that. Uh, the foundational concept of supervision, regardless of institution type, charter, or size, is compliance management. And I think it's worth just saying a few words about compliance management in addition to the strategy that we pursue. Evaluating an institution CMS, as we call it, I know you're, many of you are familiar with that, is the first step in any of our engagements with an institution. A strong CMS has the right people and processes in place to ensure the institution complies with the law and when violations should they occur, they're detected quickly and remedied. So just for a quick overview and review, CMS has pillars, as we call them, and they're really the hallmarks of a well-run institution that takes its compliance obligation seriously. First, there's board and management oversight. As we all know, the tone from the top is so significant. Then there are the elements of a strong compliance program strong, well-written, and updated policies and procedures, ongoing and updated training, monitoring, monitoring and corrective action. There's nothing we love more than we come in and they tell us how they've monitored, detected, and remedied uh, and, take, and took corrective action, which we can then evaluate. 
Uh, consumer complaint response, particularly in this market, is important. And of course, a strong independent internal audit function. Our focus on CMS is not new for financial regulation. It's been a mainstay for decades. And in fact, the federal financial regulators through its council just recently updated its compliance rating system. That's the metric by which these agencies evaluate and grade the strength of institutions' compliance with consumer laws. And I would note the most significant change to the system is a new and detailed focus on compliance management. A very detailed uh, description in, in that metric that will be used uh, starting very soon to evaluate banks and, for us, non-banks uh, and their compliance position. And so as we turn to our specific findings in the consumer reporting market, we'll be highlighting in particular the progress that we've made with these market players. And I just wanted to emphasize that in FCRA compliance, the focus we have put on CMS, as Rich was, as the director was noting, is really paying off, we think. So with that, I'll turn it over to PJ. Thank you, Alice. Um, I just wanted to start, I want to start by, uh, by saying uh, thanks to those examiners out in the field, having been one my, myself on the state level years ago, uh, traveling long hours in a state vehicle and eating fast food. I, I appreciate the work that they've done, and, and in particular the managers, uh, as Alice mentioned, Mark Hodge um, and uh, Paul Hudson, Lamont Toomer. Thank you to those folks. Uh, I know they're out there and I uh, want to say thanks. Um, you can see uh, from our first slide uh, that compliance management, as you heard Alice uh, talking about, has been sort of the foundational work um, for our ongoing evaluation of the entity's compliance uh, with both an emphasis on consumer disputes and accuracy. But the underlying foundation goes back to that compliance management system and the lens that we look through is that, that CMS lens. We began our reviews uh, evaluating compliance management systems to evaluate how the companies are ensuring they comply with the FCRA. Uh, the components that Alice mentioned um, uh, are what make up that lens. Um, board management oversight, uh, the policies and procedures at the entity that relate to specific areas that we're, we're interested in, for instance, dispute handling as an example any training around that particular function, uh, the monitoring of, of that function, uh, as well as internal audit and complaint response. Um, these components are fundamental to every institution's compliance function, and the improvements made as a result of our initial reviews are the foundation for enterprise-wide uh, compliance efforts. And the CRC's uh, credit reporting companies have improved and continue to improve their compliance programs in many ways that positively impact consumers, and we'll go into a little more detail about that. Um, as you can see, there's been follow-up work as well as uh, uh, as well as initial work. So, where we've done uh, compliance-related work, uh, we've come back to see that. Uh, uh, certain changes have been made, um, and that continues and is ongoing, uh, be it through uh, dispute handling or accuracy work, um, and continues into the future in our supervisory role. As Alice mentioned, uh, the focus has primarily been on uh, data accuracy uh, and dispute investigation and, and resolution. And let me just uh, break those two down briefly. Uh, the dispute handling uh, portion of, of our work has emphasized more the front-end handling of disputes through the various channels uh, that the consumer reporting companies might receive uh, disputes from, uh, from consumers. So uh, those might be phone, internet, uh, mail, uh, and those channels are uh, key and how those channels operate in the intake portion of the dispute process, uh, what the policies and procedures around uh, that intake function, and then essentially what what um, the next step might be 
uh, to handle that dispute uh, was the primary focus on the dispute handling front. Uh, whereas in dispute resolution, our work uh, was more of an evaluation of the, uh, I'll call it the back half of the dispute process. It was more related to ultimately how disputes are resolved and uh, how those uh, results are communicated to consumers. Um, accuracy is uh, uh, a little um, uh, a little harder to to break into pieces. Uh, we'll, we'll do so moving forward, but it's really um, at its core an evaluation of how the compliance management program is working to improve overall accuracy. Um, so here you have uh, a diagram that was created by CFPB supervision to highlight some of the data accuracy enhancements that many consumer reporting companies have undertaken. Um, you, can, you can see from the slide that it is a, a cycle. Um, uh, the hope is that there is a continuous improvement cycle uh, that involves these various aspects of data management, from data governance, uh, the, the, the rules uh, around the handling of the data and changes that might be made to the business that could impact data, quality control, oversight of public records providers, furnisher vetting, and, and ongoing monitoring of the data received from the furnishers. Again, these are all uh, aspects that are reviewed through a CMS lens. So going a little bit deeper into what these might, uh, what these might break down to, um, in data governance, we're really talking about systems that are crucial to accuracy and data integrity uh, and, and the obligations of the consumer reporting companies. Um, but a functioning data governance program should establish and clearly document the company's system of decision rights and accountabilities for handling consumer information, and managing changes that may affect the information. Um, quality control is really post-report compilation testing. Uh, so information comes in, it is compiled, and, and a report is produced. Um, but quality control, if you think about it from a manufacturing standpoint, is after uh, the automobile is built, is how does it test out on the track? Data quality reports to furnishers are key in this. Uh, furnishers need to know where, they're, uh, where they need to improve, uh, and that needs to be an ongoing dialogue uh, with the consumer reporting companies. So it's a feedback loop, um, and these data quality reports to furnishers are critical. The furnishers need to pay attention to them, make the required adjustments, and I know that the consumer reporting companies are actively reaching out to furnishers where they see issues and they are working with them to try to improve the data quality on a going forward basis. Furnisher oversight and, and data monitoring uh, is um, an area where robust monitoring for uh, possible accuracy issues might tie back, for instance, to looking at dispute metrics. Um, uh, that is one a possible aspect of monitoring where uh, red flags might, might make a company aware that there are issues that they should address. Once a potential issue or issues are identified, the consumer reporting company can reach out directly to the furnisher to work with them. And we've noted these efforts uh, and recognized that the consumer reporting companies want high quality data. So this is a before and after, um, a, a picture, if you will, of data governance um, some time ago uh, uh, and uh, where, where we stand uh, today and improvements are, are ongoing. Uh, initial reviews indicated that uh, some one or more CRC's data governance functions were decentralized. Um, 
and, and that responsibilities were not clearly defined. Uh, formalized uh, data governance policies um, will allow uh, changes to be made that impact data in a way uh, that is seen throughout the business. Uh, quality control, initial reviews, again, uh, some initial reviews uh, indicated that uh, this was a function uh, that was not yet robust, um, whereas uh, now uh, robust quality control programs that regularly assess the accuracy of information included in consumer reports. Um, that is, again, the, the post-compilation review quality. Um, as far as the reports are concerned, again, a continuous improvement cycle um, would require that there be consistent practices uh, and that there be a, con a continuous feedback loop um, and improve uh, data access quality reports including a no-cost provision of these reports uh, can be key to helping to continue to improve the accuracy of the data provided. And monitoring, uh, again, um, can be uh, on the front end, the re-vetting, uh, an enhanced vetting of furnishers that come on, or periodic re-vetting of furnishers uh, on a perhaps a risk tier basis. Uh, and as well as looking at dispute data and high-level metrics to try to identify red flags um, and where there, there might be reason to follow up uh, more closely with a particular furnisher. So this slide, again, is uh, <clears throat> trying to, to paint the picture um, on the uh, dispute investigation and resolution uh, work. Um, the diagram was again created by CFPB supervision to visually depict a number of the key steps taken by consumer reporting companies when processing, investigating, and responding to consumer disputes. Uh, so as you can see from, from the diagram, uh, the consumer may file the dispute uh, directly uh, with a uh, consumer reporting company uh, as opposed to with a furnisher and what happens uh, it, it may not uh, this may not be sequential in every instance but it's received it's classified I talked about the receipt channels um, and the company may resolve the issue internally in some instances uh, or they may send out the dispute uh, to the furnisher for further investigation and a way to response um, and that's true in, in many instances or most instances. Uh, the furnisher then must conduct their reasonable investigation um, and uh, review any relevant documents, for instance, and make a determination. And then the, the file can be updated. Uh, the notice um, or verification uh, can be sent to the furnisher in instances where an internal adjustment is made to make sure that the furnisher is aware of the internal adjustment and that there's been a change made to the file. Improvements in dispute handling and <coughs> resolution um, involve uh, the forwarding of all relevant information, including attachments, and in some instances, uh, enhanced use of supplementary text. So a dispute agent might um, utilize supplementary text to better explain the nature of the dispute to a furnisher. Uh, take the time to complete a text box uh, to, uh, particularly where there's a phone call uh, from a consumer, to transmit the information to the furnisher. Um, reasonable reinvestigation of disputes and consideration of relevant information again involves ensuring that uh, Relevant documents, proof documents, are reviewed and considered um, in resolving the dispute. Uh, and notice of furnishers, uh, notice to furnishers of the dispute, uh, where uh, a consumer reporting company has made the decision internally to adjust the file. Um, ultimately, consumers should be notified uh, of the results of their dispute, and uh, ongoingly the 
the consumer reporting company's efforts to improve uh, that communication, uh, as the director mentioned, uh, should make it more clear uh, to consumers what the result of their dispute is. So again, to uh, put it in a picture, uh, the before and after slide here that was prepared uh, gives some feel for um, how the market is improving uh, for consumers. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, evident that uh, consumer reporting companies are now allowing consumers to use the online portal. Uh, upload those supporting documents, uh, allowing those documents to be forwarded to furnishers and considered. Uh, obviously, uh, part of our, our work um, involves working, at furnish working uh, with furnishers as well in the supervisory space and, and ensuring that those documents are considered. Um, the uh, failure that was noted in one or more cases to consider all relevant information, um, uh, that, that uh, requires an adjustment to policies and procedures to ensure that uh, appropriate and reasonable review of the proof documents uh, is made. The dispute notices, uh, as they improve um, and become more clear, there's less confusion about ultimately what happened with the dispute versus whether uh, some other adjustment uh, to uh, the consumer's report was made. Uh, specific uh, information about the dispute is what the consumer might be uh, most interested in. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Alice Hurdy to discuss uh, furnishing. And in, uh, thank you. In light of the time, I can be brief and just summarize so we can turn it o over to discussion. You all have, you know, again, your handy dandy supervisory highlights that uh, goes even into a little further detail. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, I think we're back to uh, at furnishers, large, small, bank, non-bank. Uh, we start with compliance management system um, reviews, and not surprisingly, because we, we have not felt that the Fair Credit Reporting Act has been at the top of the list of priorities at institutions, we found um, CMS weaknesses. Uh, and as we put forward on the slide, our expectations and, and a few examples of weaknesses that we found, including, you know, again, even at furnishers, uh, no data governance program. Like this, the consumer reporting companies, they need such a, a program as well. Uh, the weak oversight by board of directors, you know, we, we can't emphasize that enough to institutions. Uh, the compliance uh, officers really don't have any hope of making it a priority to the business line if the tone from the top is that compliance uh, can be compromised in, in favor of, of the business needs. It has to be a balance. And of course, training the frontline employees is just, you know, everyday essential. And so just to, to summarize some of the key findings that we have found, you know, Regulation V of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, I think is a reasonable standard in that it asks, uh, directs furnishers to establish and implement reasonable written policies and procedures. And it, of course, is a sliding scale depending on the size, nature, uh, and uh, different functions of the institution. So you, 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 you tailor it to the size, complexity, and scope of exactly uh, what you're furnishing and how often you're furnishing. So we found a number of different types of violations. Uh, for institutions that were uh, furnishing uh, to specialty consumer reporting companies, the deposit account information on their customers, we found a lack of policies and procedures specific to deposit account furnishing, which as many of you know, is, is a different type of furnishing than standard furnishing to uh, larger consumer reporting companies. Uh, we saw lack of policies and procedures for handling and investigating direct disputes, the disputes that come directly to the furnishers. Uh, we saw um, a lack of policies and procedures to prevent duplicative or mixed file reporting to the consumer reporting companies. 
And um, the Regulation V directs every furnisher to evaluate the guidelines that are in Appendix E of the regulation. And that appendix really does, again, sound very much like the compliance management system I was talking about. It talks to training, maintaining records, and uh, those types of core elements that every business needs to evaluate. And in, in the very uh, complex and specific nature of consumer reporting, there are just some very specific considerations that institutions need to consider, uh, given, as we've said, and we all appreciate the importance of this information that is being furnished and used in some of the most critical decisions uh, consumers face and businesses face when making uh, risk-based determinations on credit and other things. Uh, and just on data accuracy, we, we did find um, a number of specific failures as we enumerate on, on this slide that are really essential to a consumer's credit profile. The date you first, a consumer first became delinquent, that needs to be reported accurately. Uh, you have to update and correct information when new information comes to you that uh, you, the furnisher, and you realize what you initially furnished was inaccurate. And then we had uh, instances of reporting information uh, with actual knowledge of errors. And in the statute, uh, you can be liable for that if you haven't specified an address for consumers to dispute the accuracy. Most furnishers do specify the address, so we often don't have this violation because they, they have uh, specified the address. And I think, in, in, again, in light of the time, you know, to dispute handling, which is critical, and PJ talked a little bit about it, how we're, we are evaluating the consumer reporting companies for it, and it's very much that back and forth interplay, and we focused attention at furnishers' obligations uh, to, in, to handle disputes once received, whether they receive them directly or indirectly. The Fair Credit Reporting Act has very, as you know, very specific uh, steps they must take and specific time periods that they must observe. And obviously, you know, the sooner that they can and the, the better that they can resolve those disputes, uh, the better off they are uh, for using that data and, of course, the better off consumers are. And finally, uh, a key tenet of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is that if a user is going to obtain a credit report, they have to have a permissible purpose. And we had an instance where one or more uh, failed to have a permissible purpose and yet they still uh, obtained a credit report. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you for walking us through um, with a goodly amount of detail, enough to give us some, some flavor for what you've been going through. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Just personally, I want to say thanks for the work of pulling back the curtain on something that is so important for all of us, every person in this room, credit. Um, it's just fundamental to how we function as a society. So I want to open it up to questions that or feedback that CAB members may have. Tim? Hey there, thank you. Uh, love the thinking. think it's a win-win-win for CRCs, lenders, and consumers alike. Um, my highly anecdotal experience um, having uh, tried to use a dispute portal uh, with each of the three individual uh, CRCs, uh, is that um, you know while while there may be checkboxes checked, uh, there hasn't been uh, th there's a wide variance in terms of uh, product quality. Uh, so my consumer journey is to uh, first uh, create an account with one of the CRCs, uh, then they try to validate uh, my identity based on some questions, and then I try to submit uh, some forms, and then finally uh, maybe there's a dispute resolution. Uh, so without naming names, I'd say one of them is a B minus experience, one of them's a D experience, and one of them's an F experience. Uh, and all along the, uh, the conversion funnel, there uh, were various issues for me, one with validating who I was, one with, uh, you know, actually uh, getting back to me in a, in a reasonable manner about what I submitted. So uh, my, my, my suggestion is really along the lines of um, uh, putting in some uh, consumer internet practices there in terms of monitoring the, convert, the actual conversion funnels for the, for the various CRCs. Josh? Uh, yeah, two points. First of all, just uh, I, I really want to commend you on, on this work. I, I think it, it really uh, shows the huge value of the Bureau more broadly. Uh, this is an area that was, uh, you know, in, had such a void 
uh, in regulation for so many years, and we ran a hotline in New York City uh, for consumer financial issues and were overwhelmed by calls from people who are tied up in knots trying to dispute inaccuracies in their credit reports. So it's really, really um, vital, important work that, that you're doing and, and great job there. Um, one point is, you know, one thing that we had identified on that hotline and it is a big problem is, uh, I mean, the big problem, of course, is, is in inaccuracies in credit reports, but also a huge problem with the way that credit reports are used. And uh, a big problem that we identified was the use by employers of, of credit history as a factor in hiring for other employment-related decisions. Uh, and this uh, is such a fundamental problem because it really, you know, obviously credit is, reflects other bigger problems in society, including discrimination, uh, and discriminatory financial practices that are then reflected out in credit reports. And, and many employers using uh, credit history as a factor in hiring when there's really no basis that job performance and credit history are related um, created huge problems. And in fact, New York City passed a law making it a discriminatory practice for employers to use credit history as a factor uh, in employment-related decisions. So I'm not sure how that fits into your supervisory role, but I just think important to put on the table because there are, in addition to accuracies and uh, inaccuracies in credit reports, the use of those credit reports, and in fact, the way that they're marketed, and many of the credit reporting companies were marketing, are marketing credit history uh, to employers as a, as a proxy uh, in making hiring decisions, and, and that can be highly problematic, so just something to flag. Thank you, Maeve. Uh, first, I wanna thank uh, Alice, PJ, and their team for the incredible work you've done with consumer uh, credit reports, and also to Director Cordray for putting this on the radar. As someone who has uh, worked in housing for many years, uh, I'm a director of a HUD approved counseling agency, and prior to that, in mortgages and real estate, uh, I have seen hundreds of people's lives really badly affected by incorrect information on credit reports, including myself. So uh, to see what you have done, and I have worked through a couple of our own clients and helped them to, to actually file complaints, and we've gotten some results. Uh, I would say that perhaps we still need to improve a little bit, but the, uh, the effect as to Josh's point where uh, employers are using credit reports for employment and also for insurance, it affects not just the ability to purchase items, it affects many different aspects of our clients' lives. And uh, I've seen this firsthand. So I really want to thank you for, for your work, and uh, we'll just continue to support you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Then Lisa? So I really have more of a, a kind of a question than, than a comment. Um, one of the things that we encounter with our clients a lot is the, the, the merged file. And um, we were having a conversation actually about this yesterday, uh, some of the cab members. It strikes me that there, there can be and there should be a way to correct what I call logically impossible errors. But I see these all the time. Um, I have a client right now, for instance, who, who according to her credit report opened a mortgage when she was in utero. Now, it seems to me that it should be logical that the furnishers have people's birth dates and the date the account was open, that that should be an easy thing that should be corrected on site through computer and mechanisms. And the furnishers, the information is correct. Somebody did have a mortgage, but it's the fact that the, the files are being merged with like names. And I'm just wondering if that is something that that is even being looked at, because th those seem to me to be very easy errors that should and could be fixed on site and seem to happen on a regular basis. Uh, so, so thank you for that question, and PJ, feel free to elaborate, but when we talk about the data quality and furnishing monitoring improvements, I, I don't have the clicker, I'd go back to slide 12 where we talked about that. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the improvements that, again, in progress, you know, it will take some time for these truly to be um, 
uh, take hold and to see widespread um, effects of the improvements, but they are developing um, systems, the consumer reporting companies, to alert furnishers when they detect those anomalies, those logical anomalies that you were talking about, and to quickly spot, identify, and correct those. So they are, those things are in progress, those types of programs. A highly complex set of data, but that you know that that's why they are who they are, and they have um, the the skill and the talent to develop those kinds of um, algorithms. Uh, so I join your fan club in finding this work super important. Thank you for doing it. I'm I'm wondering um, whether you know I, I think it may seem kind of obvious what the benefits of more accurate scores and keeping the accountability going are, but I'm wondering if um, if you've thought about even trying to monetize the benefits, really to think about like how what what are both on an individual level and perhaps maybe a larger level, and and also I think in the material that you put out, being really specific about why these issues matter. Um, I, I think many of us around the table may sort of think like, oh yeah, we know why this is important, but I think in in an effort to also lift up the important work that the Bureau is doing, it would be really interesting to kind of show, like, here are the here are the five bullet points, here's how much, or even, you know, use a, co a, a character where you create a set of situations and you show how much money that person would save by having um, the ac inaccuracies corrected. Could be pretty powerful, I think. Will? Great, and I'll add my thanks as well uh, to the group. It's been a uh, good conversation. Uh, Director Cordray uh, addressed this in his his comments, but we're seeing a growing um, issue, and that's the, the the companies that are actually preying on people when they're very vulnerable, and the so-called credit credit cleaners, and um, it, it's just it's 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 building. Uh, they're making uh, false promises. Uh, the reality is, by doing what they're doing, they're actually clogging up the system for people who have legitimate uh, disputes, and um, and there are those, and they absolutely should be addressed. But again, it's 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 something um, needs to be done uh, because it's 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 affecting um, uh, many people. And again, the the ultimately uh, the 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 people that we're trying to protect are being harmed. Uh, by this, and the people that actually have a legitimate uh, dispute are being affected by this as well. So, thank you. Joanne? Thank you. I had uh, two follow-up questions on some of your data gathering in this space. Um, so, initially, the, the, the initial setup for consumers to dispute was dis dispute to the CRA. They would then send off the dispute to the furnisher. And I, I believe it was the Bureau who's initiated the, the ability to send more documentation and more information, which was so vitally important. I would be interested to know how that has helped in the dispute process, because that was always a big hurdle. It, you know, usually the dispute was, it's not me. That would get sent over to the furnisher. How does the furnisher even start to investigate that? And maybe they had some documentation of a, whether it would be license plate or something. So I'd be interested to know how that has helped. I think that would be some good data. The other follow-up is about two years ago when you were looking at medical um, reporting and some of the problems with that, you had asked uh, furnishers to submit monthly reports about um, some of the some of the larger some of the well monthly reports about some of the uh, disputes that were being submitted and I wanted to know how that data gathering was was coming along and when we would see some information about that. So furnishers were required to submit to the CFPB some of the trends in reporting that they were seeing some of the disputes so if we would see you know some information about that. Uh, so thanks. I think on that second point you may be thinking of, or what I'm thinking of, is um, the annual data requests that we're making to larger consumer reporting companies. And so that is done within our supervisory authority, and it's very helpful for us to get the information, and we publish the template of, of the questions that we ask, and we're updating that. And it really helps us 
to really stay abreast of the trends at each of those institutions. So we're, we mostly use it for internal purposes. Um, and of course, two of the three largest consumer reporting companies are publicly traded. And some of the information we're asking is, is information that would be uh, some of it they would publicly report. But we are using all of that data, including dispute uh, rates, to help inform our entire supervision and enforcement um, program. It helps us identify which furnishers do have high dispute rates. And we definitely are using that information as we identify how we should be spending our resources. We're a little tight on yeah. time and we have already cut into our, our, our next session a little bit because we just, we want everything. We want it all. We want to cover it all well. Thank you. Thanks to the cab members. Thanks to the staff for just incredibly valuable work and for the helpful visuals that help us better understand how you're approaching the work and, and um, how, uh, how the system comes together, uh, the system that you're focused on studying. And we'll um, have se uh, several presenters this afternoon who are gonna be uh, sharing their expertise also and furthering um, our, our thoughts on credit reporting. So thank you, Alice and PJ. Thank you, CAB members. Um, we'll now hear from Tony Alexis, Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office of Enforcement, and Patrice Ficklin, Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office of Fair Lending, and Rebecca Gelfon, Deputy Fair Lending Director, Office of Fair Lending and Enforcement. Um, they will provide an overview of the Bureau's fair lending work to date and how this work furthers the Bureau's mission. So, um, in 25 words or less, and you know, it's, I wish we had one, you know, these were half-day sessions crammed into an hour, but thank you very much. Take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, in, in addition, thank you, Cab, for having us here today. Uh, I would like to kind of set the table. Uh, so I am the head of an office, but it's not a standalone office. It's an office in an integrated division, which is supervision, enforcement, and fair lending. You know, our strategic plans are aligned, our resources are aligned, we have an understanding of what our abilities are to impact the market uh, and you know what the appropriate tool choice and how we uh, approach the market is better understanding of the landscape and better understanding of which tool is the best way to address problems when we see them. Um, so I, I just want to make sure you know that we don't operate in a vacuum. So when we listen to the supervisory highlights, you should know that that's uh, work that we embrace and in some cases that's work that we contribute to the Office of Supervision and then all of our enforcement work uh, is collaborative and also reflects the work of the Office of Fair Lending and the Office of Supervision as well. Uh, so. Uh, so now that I just described who we are, uh, you should know that in the last five years, and, and some of this work that we've done, we haven't done with full capacity. So we're at full capacity now. Uh, we consider ourselves to be stood up. I could always use more, uh, but, but nevertheless, we, we, you know, we have our, our team right now. And some of our work in the last five years was done without a complete team. So, so understand, uh, despite the resources that we've had, I think the director has been very supportive and generous to us. I think our leadership has been very generous to making sure that we have what we need uh, this is what we've accomplished very quickly. And again, it's not all about the numbers because behind all these numbers are people. And also behind these numbers are where the numbers are no longer. And so where complaints aren't being seen anymore, uh, behaviors have changed, et cetera. But in terms of dollars, we have about $3.7 billion in monetary compensation. Uh, and which also includes a $7.7 .7 billion in principal reductions, which includes cancellation of debt, adjustment of loan terms, et cetera. 26 million consumers who will receive relief as a result of the CFPB enforcement work. I think the most important thing to think about that is when you just do the simple math out of 318 million uh, consumers or citizens in the United States, that's one out of 11, one out of 12 people have, have felt the CFPB in a tangible, real way. And one of the things that I always tell people within CEPHAL when I go speak to the examiners, when I speak to my staff, when I uh, have uh, the pleasure of co-hosting with Patrice and, and Rebecca, I mean, the people that we champion, especially the devocalized, the people who don't have a voice, 
Uh, and those are the people that when you ride the subway with or when you are served food or when you walk across the street, those people have felt us in a way that's positive. Uh, and, and in five years, I think that that's uh, very, very important. And then we've returned about a half billion dollars into the CMP fund and, and a very, very short piece about that. That's not our operation money. That We don't eat what we kill. That's not our money. That money goes back to consumers. Uh, sometimes when we um, operate in the enforcement world, institutions are broken and they cannot function unless they violate the law. And when we put them out of business, consumers are the ones that are out of pocket. We stop the bad practice, but consumers are there, especially debt relief companies, uh, student loan debt relief companies. Uh, they, they are gone and there's no possibility that consumer will ever get their money back and that fund is there to make sure where those circumstances exist and we can we get the money back to the consumers it is not operation money for us um, so the office of enforcement uh, looks at the thing looks at our world our lens through various markets and as you can see uh, we touch everything from mortgages which is a, a very significant uh, Peace for homeowners and uh, citizens in our country, all the way down to uh, credit cards, bank accounts, and you'll hear later uh, credit discrimination issues uh, from the Office of Fair Lending when Rebecca gives her very good presentation. Um, so we touch everything. Unfortunately, again, we have an incredible limit on the number of people we have. We can't be every place, everywhere, but we do try to make sure that when we create our strategic plan that we are able to touch as many markets effectively with the resources that we have. Uh, our jurisdiction is, as, as the name would suggest, is consumer financial products and services. Uh, and basically anyone who offers those products, including service providers to those. And, and you should know if you read our, uh, our, some of our enforcement matters as well as the supervisory highlights, which Alice referred to, you'll see that we have informed people who are service providers as well as the direct providers that you can't just third party outsource your responsibility to consumers to someone else and not expect that you have to be compliant with the law. Um, and then you'll see that our remedies, if you go through our enforcement matters, have been to get money back to consumers directly, to freeze assets, uh, disgorgement, but perhaps the best thing that we have is the injunctive tool to really change behavior on a going forward basis. And then you'll hear as I go through some of the matters that I have, we also monitor this. Uh, it is very resource intensive, uh, Patrice will tell you, as well as Rebecca. Uh, it, we just don't collect orders and move on. We then monitor to make sure that the entities are complying. And from time to time we have seen uh, where, uh, you know, actors in our space have maybe have taken a little bit of a, well, they're not going to watch me now that they have this order. And then we've had to go back and re-engage with them in a way that uh, causes them to be put back under a new order. Uh, the laws that we enforce, uh, are, this is just a, a snapshot of the statutes. Uh, the, the, the critical thing to understand is these laws were not all created the day that CFPB was born. They have existed for a long time. I, I, I think that it's uh, sometimes when I'm having conversations with people or sometimes when I meet entities that we're negotiating with, uh, sometimes the notion of shock and surprise, I was unprepared, I didn't know I have to comply with this law, this is so new to me. And then you pull the statute open and you look at the date of the law and you say, wow, this law is 45 years old. Um, so it, it's, it's not true. We're, we're singular in focus in terms of consumers and what we do is to make sure that people uh, abide by their obligations to consumers in the law. Uh, and these are some of the, the regs that, that we also enforce. Um, so years ago, when when um, it was asked typically, what are your priorities? I, I think the director very well uh, said it by talking about the market in terms of the four Ds, and the four Ds were uh, deception, debt traps, dead ends, and discrimination. I'm going to address deception, debt traps, and dead ends, and Rebecca and Patrice will uh, will address discrimination. 
And, and deception is, you know, obviously the ones that stand out the most, and those are the a person that, uh, and the fraud end of the market is just really creating a program with a way to skirt the law in order to maximize what they can get and leave consumers harmed and broken. But you have very uh, credible institutions that are out there that when they market and sell their products, they are not describing the products in a way that a consumer can make a full and informed choice. And sometimes it, it leans towards being very deceptive about either how a product works or what the cost of the product is. Um, debt traps are, again, the practice of cycling. Uh, and a person who may have short-term need for money uh, or, or financial products and before you know it they are now in uh, a, a, a trap and that it's very difficult for them to get out of. Um, and dead ends, a, again, are I can't vote with my feet. I did not select this particular service provider, you know, a little bit of, for example, the credit reporting agency. No one raises their hand and says, I want one of these three institutions to be my credit uh, reporting agency of choice. Uh, but as a result, their incentives are not necessarily aligned with consumers in a way that consumers have equal voice to be able to speak up in the market and say, I'd like you to change this. I'd like you to service my mortgage this way. I'd like you to really make sure that you're, as you're obligated to account for my money this way uh, and that's where we're very very important in that particular market it's impossible for me to go through all five years worth of our enforcement matters uh, but, but I wanted to give you a highlight of, of some of the things that we did again uh, riffing on these themes of deception debt traps and dead ends and uh, recently we took action against three reverse mortgage uh, companies for deceptive ad advertisements and that was American Advisors Group, Reverse Mortgage Solutions, and Aegean Financial. American Advisor Group is the largest reverse mortgage lender in the United States. It ran television ads almost daily, disseminated uh, its information kit to approximately one million consumers. In their ads, they represented that consumers could not lose their home and they did not have the right, I mean, they would have the right to stay in their home for the rest of their lives. Uh, customers and consumers would have no monthly payments and with high reverse mortgage they could uh, be able to pay off all debts. Uh, in addition uh, that uh, they made representations about what their heirs uh, would or would be able to inherit uh, once, the, uh, once they passed. Uh, based on this uh, AAG was required to pay a civil money penalty of $400,000. Uh, when I first came to the Bureau, I was in the Office of Enforcement, and I would go around the country and speak to uh, various uh, law enforcement officers, and I specifically spoke to HUD and others. Uh, they, they always complained about reverse mortgages. That was one of the things that they complained about the most. So it was very gratifying for us to be able to engage in this market in a way um, that we think is going to uh, provide a signal to the market that we will be here and we're going to enforce the law when it comes to reverse mortgages. Uh, the other case was reverse mortgage solutions, uh, which made similar misrepresentations, but they also misrepresented that heirs would inherit the home and they didn't disclose the conditions of inheritance, and that is that they had to uh, pay uh, the reverse mortgage as well as um, any assessed value of the home, uh, including taxes, et cetera. Uh, we ordered them to pay a CMP of $325,000. Uh, the last group also had embedded in it uh, a GN, uh, another thing that we keep our eye out for, and that is uh, they market it to a, a specific group, and that is a uh, Spanish-speaking consumers in California. In addition to some of the misrepresentations, they falsely affiliated itself with the government uh, in its Spanish language advertisement. In one ad, it said, if you are 62 years or older and you own a house, we have good news for you. You qualify for a reverse mortgage from the United States Housing Department. Um, and the GM was ordered uh, to pay a penalty of $65,000. Uh, and I guess we could query why it would ever be good news that someone's aligned with the government, but that's for another day. Um, in, also in the deception world, I, I think the one uh, deception case that this stands out the most for us is Wells Fargo and the sales practice matter, where we had to bring an enforcement action uh, for their deceptive practices. And, and Quite simply, it was 
they were opening accounts in secret of consumers without consumers' permission, without their knowledge, and it went as far as to use uh, phony uh, email addresses, uh, uh, phone numbers, etc. And all told, uh, we uh, gave them a penalty of $100 million along with a $35 million civil penalty from the OCC and $50 million to the city and county of Los Angeles who did an incredible amount of work uh, in that matter. Uh, one of the things that, that I think it highlighted, and again, going back to the supervisory highlights and other things that we've warned people in the market about, is number one, incentive alignment, but number two, um, making sure that you have programs and that you should be able to market programs and you should be able to have certain types of incentives for your employees to be able to gain rewards, et cetera. But it's another thing to do it in an unchecked fashion, especially where you already know that the uh, incentive of that particular uh, person may not be aligned with the consumer that they're doing business with and the opportunities to, uh, to be able to uh, fudge or cheat uh, exist and that you need to monitor it in a way that is really designed to protect the consumer, just not the institution. Um, we also uh, find Santander, uh, $10 million for illegal overdrafts, uh, and there they had a telemarketing um, vendor that deceptively marketed overdraft services and then signed some bank customers who thought that the only thing that they were giving was uh, confirming information when in fact what they were doing is they were taking their information and enrolling them into uh, the overdraft product. Um, and, and again, it, it, this is several years later and it should not come as a surprise to the Office of Supervisory Highlights again and others, we said, monitor what your third-party service providers are doing. You cannot outsource that information and free yourself of any compliance obligations. And in that particular matter, they had outsourced that responsibility to a vendor and the vendors, uh, from looking at the call scripts as well as the telephone calls, were clearly violating the law in a way that was, uh, that was detectable and could have been uh, corrected. Uh, we recently filed a suit against uh, TCF, um, and I'm not going to speak too much about that because, again, it's a complaint, uh, but we sued TCF because it steered consumers into costly overdraft services, um, and you're not allowed to charge overdraft fees until a person opts in. And we allege, and obviously this will be determined in court or not, that they designed its application process to obscure the fees and make overdraft seem mandatory for some uh, uh, customers. And then um, they created, again, another incentive plan to reward people and reward the institution as they got people to opt into those uh, particular products. Um, and with regard to Equifax and TransUnion and as well as our CRAs, in January we took action against Equifax and TransUnion for deceiving consumers about the usefulness of actual cost of credit scores they sold to consumers. Uh, the, company, the company steered consumers into costly recurring payments for credit related products with uh, false promises. We ordered them to truthfully represent the value of these credit scores they provided um, and the true cost of what it was that they were obtaining. Uh, between them, TransUnion and Equifax uh, paid $17.6 million in restitution, as well as penalties totaling $5.5 million. Uh, interestingly, again, the issue was when it came to deception, was a consumer may believe that, that they were getting a product for only a dollar and then not finding out that the cost was more, but also that it wasn't a one-time cost, that they were actually enrolling in a recurring uh, product that was going to continue to cost them money. Um, and then also Equifax had an additional violation and that is in order to get to your free score you're supposed to be able to navigate um, without advertisements to get to that particular portal to get your free score and Equifax uh, put other ads in order to try to sell some of their products before you could get to that particular portal to get your free uh, credit score. Uh, and so that also was, was part of the reason why we pursued uh, pursue them 
And again, it was a very nice point of collaboration with the Office of Supervision because that matter had started through their exam activity. Um, debt traps, uh, I, I, again, I, I spoke about you know, how a person could fall into a downward spiral and ruin their life uh, and their personal finances. And one I want to focus on in this particular um, session is also one that was uh, in, in, incredibly distasteful because it involves service members. You know, these are the people that are putting it all on the line, that are serving our country, and, uh, and then afterwards become victims because of their circumstances. Uh, their, their money is, is different and trying to uh, possibly be deployed overseas and at the same time run a, a family at, at a base that may be somewhat uh, different from what their normal home is like. Uh, people have to make very sudden uh, credit decisions. And we uh, pursued Freedom Furniture and Military uh, Credit Services in December of 2014. Uh, we sued a furniture and electronics retailer that catered to U.S. military members with stores located near the bases. Uh, they offered credit to consumers purchasing its merchandise and then transferred the contracts to an affiliated company um, uh, who provided the financing for the purchases. We sued these companies for illegal debt collection practices as well as initiating and filing lawsuits, debiting consumers' accounts without authorization, and then contacting service members, uh, commanding officers. And that's a very, very unique thing if you're in the military to have your commanding officer contacted because of the threat of, for example, having your security clearance uh, uh, withdrawn or being disciplined uh, pursuant to the military code. Um, we required these companies to pay over $2.5 million in consumer redress and to pay a $100,000 civil penalty. Yet, despite being under order, two years later, we had to take action against military credit services because they had not changed their contract disclosures as required. Um, and then we had to, again, let them know, and this is an example, that we monitor our orders. And we determined that they were violating our order, and we ordered them to pay, very recently, a $200,000 penalty. Um, Bridgepoint uh, was for student loans, uh, and in that particular case, again, this, this, the student lending market is a very, very uh, touchy market right now. Uh, we, we know what the numbers are in terms of the number of uh, loans that are, are, are going out the door, how much debt is being incurred by students, um, and, and so it's a market that we're very engaged with. Uh, Bridgepoint uh, would provide extra lending for their students who could not make it on their institutional loans and the private loans. And what the issue is that they marketed it as and telling the borrowers that they could pay the loans off with monthly payments as little as $25. There was nothing realistic about that and, and they certainly knew it. Uh, they had to refund all payments made by students towards private student, loan, student loans taken from the school including principal and interest, uh, which is about $5 million. Uh, we also asked and demanded that they uh, discharge all outstanding debt for its institutional loan program, which is about $18.5 million. And what was good about that is obviously um, the students are in a better position than they were uh, before. In addition, uh, we uh, rolled out a very unique tool um, which was the uh, cost of college tool. And it, so now they have to make the cost of college clear and mandatory financial um, aid shopping tool, uh, which I, I think is pretty, uh, pretty unique and, and very, very uh, nice. Uh, so uh, a student can really sit, out, sit down and, and comparatively shop for that particular program with that particular skill set and figure out what the cost would be um, at that institution. I also spoke about dead ends, and with dead ends, the, one of the areas that we've said that we would always be active is mortgage servicing. You don't choose your mortgage servicer, and if things go wrong, things can happen uh, to you in a profound way to change your life pretty quickly, uh, and, and that is um, in, in my embracing that people should uh, create bad credit card add-ons, but in a credit card add-on matter, you're talking about a couple of 
uh, you know, fifteen, twenty dollars uh, distributed over a certain period of time, and possibly getting that money back feels a little different than if a mortgage servicing matter goes wrong. You're you're talking about losing your home, uh, and being asked to shift your family's life, move your school district, uh, ruin your life, uh, and so. We, we embarked on mortgage servicing rules at the Bureau. It was one of the first uh, rule writing exercises. And one of the things that we did was we, with the Office of Supervision, began to monitor compliance with our mortgage servicing rules. Um, and in one matter, uh, City Mortgage Company, uh, we ordered them to pay $17 million in redress and a $3 million penalty. There, one of the issues is if you're a struggling homeowner and you believe that you're eligible for a loan modification, you can apply and someone's supposed to take you information and when the application's complete, you go into one channel. Um, but in order for the application to be complete, uh, the institution was sending a letter that was flawed because it indicated the documents and forms that weren't necessarily needed by that particular consumer, then would go out to the consumer, uh, causing confusion and anxiety for consumers. Uh, 41,000 of those uh, letters uh, went out to consumers, uh, adding to confusion, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that I, I would like to point out about city, however, is they should be lauded. They had taken affirmative steps uh, to reach out to the borrowers before um, in order to see if they would be able to qualify for a loan modification. It's just that that letter um, and the implication of that letter uh, is, is what caused uh, the harm in this particular matter. Uh, the last one that I'd like to talk to before I turn it over for uh, the discussion about discrimination would be Navient. And again, Navient is just a complaint. These are allegations. Uh, we've yet to prove these in court but we sued the, nation, the nation's largest servicer of both federal and private student loans for systemically and illegally failing borrowers at every stage of repayment. Um, and, and so we're talking about more than 6 million accounts, uh, and it services more than $300 billion in federal and private student loans. Uh, and the, a flavor of the allegations that are in our complaint that you can read was uh, that they failed to correctly apply and allocate borrower payments to their accounts. They steered struggling borrowers uh, towards paying more than they would have to on loans. They obscured information consumers needed to maintain uh, their lower payments and deceived private student loan borrowers about requirements to release their cosigner uh, or cosigners uh, from loans. Um, and in some cases for uh, disabled and uh, borrowers, including severely injured veterans, uh, they harmed their credit when there were certain programs that they were eligible for. They did not uh, capture their eligibility appropriately. And again, that's uh, currently under litigation, so uh, I'll let those allegations stand as they are now. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Fair Lending so that they can discuss discrimination, which is our, the fourth D which, again, is incredibly damaging uh, to the market when, when a player discriminates against a borrower. Thanks, Tony. And uh, let's see, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> So for the past five years, we've been working very hard to ensure that consumers are not excluded from or made to pay more for mortgages, auto loans, or credit cards on the basis of their race or ethnicity. While the Bureau has taken important strides in our efforts to protect consumers from credit discrimination and broaden access to credit, we continue to identify new and emerging fair lending risks. Going forward, one area of focus is redlining for us. Redlining is a form of illegal disparate treatment in which financial institutions make it more difficult for consumers to access credit based on the racial or ethnic composition of the neighborhood. The term derives its name from the literal red lines that were drawn on a map to show where loans would not be provided. Our focus on redlining is from an access to credit standpoint. 
particularly in light of contractions in the mortgage lending market in the wake of the Great Recession. The Bureau has announced two redlining enforcement actions to date, Hudson City and Bancorp South, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those today. Hudson City Savings Bank was our first redlining enforcement action. On September 24th of 2015, the Bureau and the Department of Justice filed a joint complaint against Hudson City Savings Bank that alleged discriminatory redlining practices in mortgage lending that denied residents in majority Black and Hispanic neighborhoods fair access to mortgage loans. The complaint alleged that from at least 2009 to 2013, Hudson City illegally avoided and thereby discouraged consumers from applying for credit in majority Black and Hispanic neighborhoods in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania, the areas from where it received the vast majority of its applications. It avoided locating branches and loan officers in majority Black and Hispanic neighborhoods. It also avoided using mortgage brokers from whom it got 80% of its mortgage applications in majority Black and Hispanic neighborhoods. It excluded majority Black and Hispanic communities from its marketing strategies and it excluded majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods from the areas it committed to serve. Moreover, analysis of Hudson City's mortgage application showed that it was significantly underserving majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods as compared to its peers. Our most re recent redlining action was Bancorp South. On June 28th of 2016, the Bureau and the Department of Justice filed a joint complaint against Bancorp South alleging discriminatory mortgage lending practices that harmed African Americans and other minorities. The complaint alleged that Bancorp South engaged in numerous discriminatory practices, including redlining and discrimination in underwriting and pricing of certain mortgage loans, as well as implementing an explicitly discriminatory denial policy. Today I want to focus on the redlining allegations. From at least 2011 to 2013, Bancorp South illegally redlined in the Memphis area, the market from which it received the majority of its applications. It structured its business to avoid and discourage consumers in minority neighborhoods from accessing mortgages. Specifically, the bank placed its branches outside of minority neighborhoods. It excluded nearly all minority neighborhoods from the area it committed to serve and it directed nearly all of its marketing away from minority neighborhoods. Bancorp South also lagged significantly far behind its peers who engaged in significantly greater lending activity in those minority neighborhoods. As part of our investigation, the Bureau also sent testers who are individuals who are carefully trained to pose as prospective borrowers and record their experiences. We sent them to several Bancorp South loan branches to inquire about mortgages, and the results of that testing supported the allegations in the complaint. Specifically, we allege that in several instances, a Bancorp South loan officer treated the African American tester less favorably than the comparable white tester. To address the illegal redlining, both orders in each case require a multifaceted approach to increase access to credit in the affected neighborhoods. Both institutions are required to complete an assessment of the credit needs of the affected minority neighborhoods. The credit needs assessment will include consideration of how each bank's lending operations can be expanded to meet the credit needs in those communities. Bancorp South is required to pay $4 million to a loan subsidy program in the affected minority communities, and Hudson City is required to pay $25 million to a loan subsidy program in the effective community, affected communities. This represents the largest redlining settlement as measured by such direct loan subsidies to consumers. These programs will serve to increase access to affordable credit by offering qualified applicants in the affected minority neighborhoods mortgage loans on a more affordable basis than otherwise would be available from either entity. The loan subsidies can include interest rate reductions, closing cost assistance, and down payment assistance. The banks will also be required to expand their physical presence in the affected minority neighborhoods. 
in addition to a branch that Bancorp South recently opened in a majority minority neighborhood in the Memphis area. It is required to open either a new branch or loan production office in a high minority neighborhood within Memphis. Hudson City is required to open two new branches within majority black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Bancorp South is also required to pay at least $300,000 and Hudson City a million dollars on targeted advertising and outreach to generate applications for mortgage loans from qualified consumers within the affected minority neighborhoods. Bancorp South will also spend $500,000 and Hudson City $750,000 on local partnerships to enable the banks to partner with community-based or governmental organizations that provide assistance in the affected minority neighborhoods. Finally, each order also includes an appropriate penalty, $3 million for Bancorp South and $5.5 million for Hudson City. Both the Bureau and the Department of Justice are actively engaged in administering both of these court-ordered consent orders. Thanks. I think we have time for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Patrice. Um, and I want to open up the floor to the cab members to make comments, ask questions. Anne? It's it's so impressive to hear about the work that you're doing, and I want to go back to a comment that Tony made in his introduction, which is this is really about people. And I was struck because a consumer or so uh, an individual recently called me, and he was affected by a lot of the practices that were cited in the city mortgage, the recent city mortgage action. And when when somebody loses their home, they don't just lose an asset; they lose their pride, they lose their self esteem, and and this man, two years later, was still struggling with those very issues. Like, what did I do wrong? I, 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 th I thought I was doing everything right, and I felt so deceived by the process. And he may not get his home back or even money back as a result of this action, but what was, was really affecting me was how much he felt like well, it was like a, I really did the right thing. You know, I was wronged, and at least somebody's acknowledging that something happened, and it was, it's a way for him to start his healing. And... And so I think that those stories are oftentimes lost in the legal filings and the lawyers and the monies and the dollars. But just to know that your work, sometimes in people that you may not even know that you're touching, is making a real difference in them being able to put their lives together and move forward. And I just want to commend you for that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jean, then Chris. Yeah, thank you. And I would like to echo everyone's comments. I mean, the work that you guys have been doing in this space, uh, it was just so important for consumers. Um, you know, my organization deals with uh, millions of folks who are uh, suffering from the housing crisis. And so we see evidence every day of the challenges that they face. And, you know, and uh, the know that there's an agency out there looking out for their interests with power to do something about it is just so, so important to, to all of us in the space. But I have a, a question related to the, uh, the reverse mortgage um, uh, the settlement. And specifically, I know you talked about the civil uh, penalties um, uh, 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 requirements there, but uh, I was wondering why there was no specific focus on restitution. Was it that the borrowers, uh, the, uh, the folks when they got the, their uh, reverse mortgages, were the terms more clear when they actually signed the contracts or were there misrepresentations sort of resolved um, in that process some way? Um, because there was focus on so a penalty, but not like on a restitution. Um. Am I on? Okay. Um, at least this lighting system. Uh, when we can figure out a way to get restitution back to consumers and, and redress to consumers, we do so. Uh, in this specific matter, I think it was difficult to a portion or come up with a, a redress formula, uh, especially under some circumstances where there, there actually may be the benefit of the bargain, the consumer got the loan, it, those types of things. So when we can identify circumstances in which consumers should get redress, we endeavor to do so. The director has always made that very clear that that's one of our number one missions. Chris, then Neil. I'll uh, join the course as well, and, and uh, uh, congratulating you on the on the work that you've done. And it's always it's impressive to see the the totals that you've you've got here and the the impact 
that you're having on consumers and families, and specifically the amount of money that is unfairly or unjustly being taken out of consumers' pockets that's being returned to them is is significant. So this is a huge accomplishment that you've done. And you know, you work in enforcement, um, and you mentioned this in your in your comments. You know, a lot of these practices aren't new. Um, a lot of these uh, the laws and regulations that you're enforcing aren't new. Uh, what is new is that there's vigorous enforcement in areas that traditionally haven't had it. Um, and so it's important that you know, this work continue and, it, uh, and that it continue with the kind of vigor that you've, uh, that you've put into it. What's also been clear about the Bureau's approach is that it's been incredibly deliberate and that you, this is a, a, a duty that you don't take lightly. Uh, and so you spend a lot of time considering what the impact will be both on the, uh, on the consumer and on the business line and that you uh, take approaches that are, that are appropriate and that are fair and that um, use the best both legal and statistical tools that you have available uh, to make them happen. Um, there are a couple cases in particular that have kind of always come to light or that have shown, really shown a light on issues that we've been hearing about for a long time, but that uh, local law enforcement just may not have had the, uh, the tools or the ability to be able to, to go after them. You mentioned the Freedom Financial case, and you know that company, along with others that uh, were targeting service members and not only just taking advantage of their, their relative youth and inexperience, uh, but also really taking advantage of the fact that it's a transient population and one that, you know, you can't take, you know, if you're a Marine based at Camp Lejeune, you can't just take a day off to drive up to Virginia and sit in on an arbitration hearing because you got ripped off on some really crappy furniture at high prices. Um, those are important issues, and I, you could hear the cheers from the bases in North Carolina when you, that enforcement action was taken. The Miles case is another one where it was, again, really taking advantage of the relative youth and inexperience of enlisted personnel. So. This work is vitally important. We're, I, I, I'm glad you're doing it, uh, and glad you're doing it in the way that you're doing it. So thank you. Thanks. Neil and Paulina. Sure. So you, in the cases of redlining you cited, what you know it jumps to me is, is that you have a product and a remedy that is kind of about something that's pretty tangible and physical, and that it also, uh, you know, allows you to think about how you can get access to credit across you know, across communities. How are you thinking about redlining as it relates to uh, more digital products or stuff that's not digitally delivered? And how is that, and, and if you are, what would the remedies be that you would consider to be appropriate? Thank you, that's a great question, particularly given the fact that redlining has traditionally been very geographically focused. And in terms of thinking about digital remedies, that's certainly been a topic of discussion within our team. And we do believe that the same redlining framework can be brought to bear with regard to lenders who operate in the digital space. I think in terms of thinking about what that uh, lender's targeted market is and thinking about ways in which to expand that market if we were to find redlining, thinking about ways to engage in affirmative outreach that would potentially drive more diverse traffic, uh, to those online portals are a couple of ideas that come to mind. So thank you, and particularly given the fact that we have um, the obligation uh, that we take very solemnly to uh, provide a level playing field, to look at not only traditional lenders, but also non-traditional lenders who often operate in that digital space. And I'll also mention that redlining doesn't apply necessarily just to housing. It can apply to other credit products as well. So yeah, it's got that's much one of the reasons I, I asked the question. I because, thought I heard that in that question yeah, as well. Yeah, because so. I think that one of the things that I have got a concern about is, is that the service test, as it's described on the CRA, I think is a bit outmoded given the mm -hmm. uh, era that we live in. And how, you, how are you then going to be able to uh, provide access to communities uh, in, in a way that uh, it, it, you know, isn't as obvious as counting how many branches you might have in a particular MSA. No, I think that's exactly right, and I do think that one of the, the key places to begin is with the particular um, customer acquisition strategy, market strategy, that an institution puts in place, and thinking about that in the context of expanding access to credit. Paulina, then Josh. 
Thank you. Um, two, two quick points. Um, banking the unbanked is, is so important, um, especially for low-income consumers and um, protecting them from um, stripping assets in terms of fees. And the deceptive practices around overdraft and um, a, um, accounts. Um, so in the Wells Fargo case and this Santander, am I saying that right, case, um, really harm those um, type, of, they push people out of banking. And so um, I think it's really important to have the CFPB um, on the side of consumers and to be able to say to consumers that um, you're doing this work. And so I really want to commend you on those two cases. So thank you for that. The second piece is that um, I really want to call attention to the fact that um, you really um, the work that you're doing works in conjunction with the states. Um, so in California, and, and by not preempting state law, but working in conjunction with state law. So in California, we have the Homeowner Bill of Rights and the, now the Survivor um, Bill of Rights. And so um, with the uh, mortgage servicing rules and the successor of interest rules, um, we now in the state of California, our um, homeowners are doubly protected. And this is so important. Um, and the other day we heard in terms of speaking about people People, um, of another home saved um, because of both the Survivor Bill of Rights and the Successor of Interest Rules working together. So thank you so much for your work in this in this area. Josh, then Lynn. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, and I think my comments um, echo a lot of the comments that have been said, but are uh, um, important to say nevertheless, or important to emphasize is, is really to commend uh, the Bureau on the enforcement work that you're, you've done, uh, and again to highlight that these practices have been going on for so many years um, with little accountability uh, for many of us who, who, you know, who are w working on these issues going way back, and it's uh, so critical to have an agency, a federal agency, that's working closely with, with uh, state AGs uh, to crack down on a lot of these practices, and it's been really um, again, that the way that you've worked uh, with supervision, uh, the way that you've funneled information through your complaint process and gotten information in the field, working closely with stakeholders in the field, I think has been really vital. And people in communities that are affected by these practices really feel like there's a, a voice in Washington that's responsive to the impact of these practices on communities. Uh, and finally, that uh, really the deterrent effect of your enforcement actions has been really critical uh, and you've done a really good job at um, working in so many different areas despite your limited resources around debt collection and, and accounts and overdraft and, and mortgage servicing, student lending, consumer reporting, etc. Uh, and, and, and that those actions have been an important piece of the puzzle in really deterring uh, abusive behavior and creating a, a level playing field for, for fair financial services providers. So thank you for that. I'll echo the thanks. Uh, the work that you have been doing with respect to reverse mortgages is, is absolutely groundbreaking. I'm not aware of anyone else that has looked at this product, which is so confusing and, and different from any other mortgage product. Just the fact that you have to be 62 years old to get the mortgage um, can can pr make it seem that there's a population getting the mortgage that sometimes often don't understand the rules even when they're clear. So your efforts toward the deceptive marketing are, are very important. Um, also, it, it, they're sort of confusing because there are no payments required, so the only way you can default on a reverse mortgage is to fail to pay your insurance and taxes, to die or not to live there. And we have seen a marked increase as a result of the deceptive marketing in foreclosures of 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds who have, who have not committed any of those offenses. Um, and so we, are, um, uh, for example, people who have kept their insurance and taxes current are being foreclosed upon and losing their homes because they've not paid a couple hundred dollars worth of taxes and insurance, sometimes even less. And I guess even more disturbing are the people who are being foreclosed upon uh, for failing to occupy their homes when they have been there for, for decades. Um, I've, I've had recently people who have come to the office who had lived in their home for 40 years, um, were served with the foreclosure papers at their home. 
the foreclosure went forward because of their age they didn't really understand the mortgage or the process and so they came home one day and all of their worldly belongings they had gathered over the past 70 or 80 years were in the front yard or at least what was left um, and so we're seeing a lot more of these types of foreclosures being filed when the borrowers are communicating with the servicer the entire time but they're still being sued to for and foreclosed upon for not living in their home so there's a disconnect and the servicers say that there are rules not contained in the note or the mortgage that the servicers have to follow but the borrowers are not aware of um, and so I know that the agency is really interested in this in this area and I think the approach the agency is taking is very important because what the agency is doing so far as I understand it is saying okay what we need to do is look at the problem we need to, to see what the problem is we need to get the all of the actors the servicers HUD everyone involved and see if we can't find a way to resolve the problem and then it may come to you um, but the work that you're doing is incredible but I also appreciate the work that is done prior to cases getting to you to make sure that there's there's not another way to address the problem other than litigation so thank you Thanks, Lynn. Gigi? Um, I, I, too, wanted to echo the commendations um, and uh, praise for uh, what you guys have done. And 12, nearly $12 billion in relief in such a short period of time is an absolutely astounding figure. That's, uh, you know, that is so much money in the pockets of American consumers. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's an unbelievable feat in such a short period of time. I especially wanted to uh, commend you guys on the uh, action against Equifax and TransUnion for their sale of credit monitoring products. You know, in addition to the terrific work being done by supervision, which I'll have a chance to talk about a little later this afternoon, um, I, I wanted to note that that is a, an issue that you know consumer advocates had long complained about the misleading sale of credit monitoring products and direct to consumer products. Um, by the big three credit reporting agencies, costing them millions of dollars with, I would say, nearly worthless um, products um, being sold deceptively. And so it, it, it is wonderful that they are being brought to account on this particular issue. Um, and I also wanted to commend you on, on a second point about the use of the civil money penalties um, for a fund to compensate consumers that can't be compensated by the businesses that um, you've taken action against. Um, many years ago, I worked in a state attorney general's office, and the bulk of my caseload was suing penny ante scam artists. Um, and it would, be, it would break my heart. You would sue them. You would get relief. There would be no money. And all these people who had been conned out of hard-earned money would get nothing in the end. And so um, that's, I think that's a terrific use of the civil money penalties. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. I will also toss my praise in your direction. You know, bless the enforcement work of the CFPB. And it's in combination also. It's intelligent. You can see there was at least one action you were talking about feeding from supervision and your understanding of what was going on from the supervision side feeding into enforcement, which seems natural and rational and um, thoughtful. There's just so much thought that goes behind enforcement. Uh, so, and, uh, and uh, very excited about the Navient suit. Um, and uh, yeah, so oodles of praise to heap on. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And, um, and, uh, and we will move forward to some of your other wonderful colleagues who have joined us this morning. Thanks, CAP members, for your comments and feedback for staff. Um, to close out this morning's session, we will hear next from the Bureau's Office of Financial Education about work the Bureau has been doing in partnership with financial institutions to encourage greater access to consumer credit scores. So we will hear from Yannicka Ratcliffe, Assistant Director at the Office of Financial Education, and Maria Jaramillo, Program Analyst, Office of Financial Education, who will be here. I can hear their footsteps in the hallway. Um, so we'll give them a little moment here to come on in, and there they are. Great, yes, wonderful, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Janneke and Maria, for joining us today. And we look forward to hearing from you. Good afternoon. Uh, Maria Jaramillo and I are here today representing the Office of Financial Education. And we're here pleased to be able to talk with you about the Open Credit Score Initiative. The Bureau is working to improve the consumer credit reporting uh, market from multiple perspectives. You heard earlier this morning about the, the work the Bureau has done to make the credit reporting market more transparent and responsive to consumers um, from the company side and other ways to get consumers more directly involved. The Bureau has encouraged expanding consumer access to and awareness of their credit scores. More and more companies now offer consumers free access to their credit scores on a regular basis, what we refer to as open credit score. This is a significant development in educating and empowering consumers to take more control over their financial lives. So first I'll present some background and then Maria will discuss our most recent project, a list of several credit card companies who offer their customers free access to a credit score. We are releasing that list today along with brand new educational content. And then we'll seek your input on this initiative, its impact on consumers, its impact on companies, and potential next steps. So there have been a lot of rapid developments in the marketplace that make publication of this company list timely. Uh, looking back, the CFPB launched its Open Credit Score initiative in February of 2014. Director Cordray delivered remarks to the CAB announcing this initiative and sent letters to the nation's top credit card companies urging them to follow the suit of the companies that had already begun offering free scores to their customers. We also worked with FICO uh, in 2015 to extend the open access initiative to nonprofit uh, organizations that provide credit and financial counseling to clients. That program allows these organizations to share the scores they pull on their clients with the clients themselves, something they could not do before then. And then in 2016, we started this project uh, of the list with a notice in the Federal Register, which Maria will describe in more detail. And then today, red arrow, we are announcing that list. So all um, this has led to a teachable moment. Um, sorry, first I'll present, oh wait, where am I? <laughs> So, um, as we can see, this is a real teachable moment. Consumers who learn their score may then seek to better understand what it means. Um, we'll see that over this period, more and more companies have started offering free access to their score, customers to their scores. In uh, November 2016, FICO announced uh, that 180 million accounts, including those at several credit unions, had this feature, and that was up from 150 million the April before that. Plus, there are a growing number of accounts where consumers have free access to a Vantage score. And then we also want to highlight that there are some other ways that um, consumers can see their credit scores for free. There are several online providers of free credit scores, and uh, also some of the companies who offer free scores to their customers also offer them to the general public. And then, as mentioned, there are the nonprofit financial counselors and some special circumstances under which one might see their score for free. So all this information, as I said, has created a teachable moment. Um, some consumers may also see many different scores from different sources due to different models and different versions of those models based uh, on different data from different reporting sources used for different purposes and perhaps even pulled on different dates. Um, our own qualitative research with consumers found there are many common areas of where more education and information could be useful including you know problems understanding the difference between reports and scores, um, confusion about the different uh, scores, not sure how to get a free credit report or whether pulling a free credit report might impact her score, and then just some confusion about what it is a consumer can do to influence uh, their, their credit score. So um, to tell you more about how today's release seeks to leverage this teachable opportunity in a way that is timely, relevant, and actionable, I will now turn it over to Maria Jaramillo. Thank you, Yannick. We wanted to share with you the objectives of the Open Credit Score initiative. The first objective is to highlight industry's efforts to increase access to free credit scores and continue to encourage industry to increase this access. The second objective, as Yannicka mentioned, is to release this uh, list of companies that are already offering their existing customers free access to a score. 
and to leverage this moment to educate, empower, and inform consumers on the importance of regularly checking their credit scores and reports. So our vision for success is to have consumers use our list to check if their credit card company offers free access to a credit score. If the company does, and they are, um, they, their service is accessible to them, to access the service, check their score, and then also um, access our educational content to uh, better understand how to use this information um, to, make their, to, to help them improve their financial decisions. We put this list together by issuing a notice in the Federal Register uh, web public website in order to let all of the industry know of the plan to publish this list. And we ask credit card issuers as well as companies in other markets to let us know if they're offering free access to credit scores to their customers and if they fit the criteria which is outlined in the slide, mainly that they are offering this access readily available to at least some of their customers um, on a continuous basis. The notice was published last October. It was open for 30 days. We got a total of 30 comments, uh, mainly from uh, credit card issuers, both large and small. We also got comments from other companies as well as from consumers. And so in your packages, you will see a copy of the list which was released today. And we wanted to let you share with you a little bit of the messages and the list. Um, and so we used the list, first of all, to highlight that there is now this uh, uh, opportunity to have access to your credit score to your credit card company. We also use the list to highlight that checking your credit scores and your credit reports is an important tool for managing your financial life. And thirdly, to keep up with the messages of our recent consent orders, we are highlighting in the document that a customer does not just have one score, that lenders use a variety of scores, which um, vary by score provider, scoring model, the time in which the, the, time in which the score is calculated, and the credit, um, um, the credit report data used as well. And finally, in the document, we share links to our educational content on credit scores and reports. In the list, we also acknowledge other options, other ways in which consumers can access free credit scores, which include companies that offer the service to the general public. We highlight that this is a different model. We also highlight that consumers can access free credit scores through certain nonprofit organizations, as Yannicka mentioned. And finally, that companies may also offer access to free credit scores through other financial products, not just through credit cards. Companies that want to be added to the list may contact us to do so if, if they fit the criteria as we outlined before, and they may contact the Office of Financial Education at the Bureau at the email listed in, in the slide. And then finally, you will also see in your package an infographic which uh, accompanies the list. And as Yannicka mentioned, the infographic, the goal of the infographic is to describe that you, why is it that you have different scores um, and where they come from. So the first part of the graph highlights examples of the different scores a consumer might have. The second part outlines the key factors that uh, play into a score, the, the, that this varies by the credit report data, the timing in which it's calculated, as well as the scoring models. And then in the, in the third part of the graph, we highlight what consumers can control, which is their credit history and behavior, which is the basis of their credit score. Okay. I think we're just advance one more slide. All right, I think we're ready for the discussion and to prompt that. Um, some of the questions we had were um, how this increased availability of scores has affected consumers, um, how it's affected the companies who are engaged, and then uh, what ways the Bureau can continue to leverage this access to help consumers. Um, and then some other questions about similar industry-driven initiatives that could positively impact consumers and suggestions that you might have for further steps. Brian. Well, uh, I commend the Bureau on putting together the additional education and research around, uh, around consumer credit scores. Uh, we've seen uh, it being 
uh, very valuable to consumers. Discover uh, started in 2013 with the with providing scores. We've in studying the consumers in terms of the benefit we've seen uh, in different studies about a 30 point increase uh, in, in consumers who frequently check the score uh, versus those who don't. Um, you know, you can argue sort of you know causality and, and the like, but it, it, certainly there's a there's a positive impact there. Um, with the, with these consumers, and it's not only good for the consumer in terms of getting them more interested in managing their financial health. It's it's a it's a win for the uh, for the industry and, and for the issuer as well. So um, we think you know the more that can be done to educate consumers about their financial health, about scores, uh, we're you know, certainly behind it. Um, I think now steps taken to uh, give give all consumers access to their scores, you know, through the nonprofits and and promoting that, and. Um, I think uh, you know a couple couple things that might uh, that we we could think about to, to to move further is one you know just any ways we can make those credit reports more readable right anybody who's pulled it uh, knows uh, the challenges that go along with it um, and second I think as we see further development now on the deposit side uh, with you know some of the credit reporting agencies there I think becoming more sophisticated in the information they provide thinking about efforts we might be able to bring that information uh, more more to light uh, with you know some of the, the bureaus that provide information that you know checking account providers look at uh, you know as they evaluate a consumer um, I wonder if there's a, a similar initiative that we could take with them to try to bring that information to light increase access to checking accounts as well okay Lisa thanks for this work it's really great and important I think I just wanted to lift up two um, Two findings I found in doing uh, interviews with hundreds of people who are oftentimes don't have very good credit. One is um, that there is confusion, I think, when, among people when they see that there are they are getting a range of scores or different scores from different agencies, and I think um, uh, not they're not knowing whether they. I, I don't think people, most people even know that there is a, a valid range of scores, but feeling like there must be an error. Which one is the right one? So there's the helping people figure out how to disentangle whether there's a range of scores that are all valid versus um, are there mistakes in their credit score and how to kind of figure that out. The, the second one is that um, I, I do think I've seen people use tools like Credit Karma, for example, uh, a lot to to repair their credit when they feel like they're in a bad place. And I think the key is not just having the score, but understanding the link between the action they take and the score that they get. And actually, Tim was showing me something last night that NerdWallet is developing that, that shows you, yeah, if I pay down this much of my mortgage, my score will go up this much. And so I think that is really important for people to be able to see if this, if I do this, then that, and the score going up or down, it makes it really concrete. Chi-Chi, then Jen. Um, so, uh, uh, yet again, I too wanted to uh, echo the um, thanks to the CFPB for engaging in this initiative. I think um, it's it's fabulous um, that it's, the Bureau is using the bully pulpit to get these uh, institutions to sort of nudge some of them um, to be part of this open access initiative. I think this will uh, contribute in the long term to the overall um, sort of economic health of, of Americans. Uh, also wanted to thank the financial institutions that have participated, uh, including some of the ones around the table, and especially um, Discover and you know, Oklahoma City early adopters. Um, you know, I, with this kind of initiative, it, um, you know, my earlier remark during the this section on enforcement, you know, saying that the, uh, the credit monitoring products were useless. I mean, there should be no need to pay for scores anymore, um, including through the, the products from the, the, the big three credit reporting agencies, um, now that with open access um, and uh, the, the other sources that that's available. Um, and uh, by the way, I should also add, add a big thanks to my fellow seatmate here at FICA because they were the ones who originally came up with the idea and sort of um, you know, made it possible for these um, the financial institutions to share the scores that they get, and it wouldn't have been possible without them. And and so this is an, an example of an industry making available for free um, instead of charging consumers an arm and a leg for information. And I think the next step now is to get the rest of the industry to follow along um, and provide for credit report access, because as Lisa said, you know, we, you don't know if the difference in your score is an error or something else until you see the credit report. And yes, you have free annual access 
um, free access through annualcreditreport.com, but think about how much easier it is to go online, check your credit cards, uh, uh, account and then hit that button for your score versus having to go through annual credit report um, then having to go to the websites for the big three and often and we've seen this anecdotally and in cases um, people will get tripped up and end up signing up for credit monitoring instead of getting their free annual report um, so um, uh, you know that that's the next I think um, frontier in this um, and I also love the idea of trying to get specialties to be part of this, including um, uh, check systems and uh, uh, their qualifile score. Tim, then Jean. Yeah, I would, I would just add um, to some of the commentary that's been, been suggested. I, uh, first of all, our longstanding commitment to financial education, consumer education at, at FICO has really dovetailed with the work that the CFPB has done. And I commend you again for, for weighing in strongly. Uh, on this credit score, open your open credit score uh, program. I think it has had a, a big impact, as as Brian points out at Discover. We get reporting from um, many of our participating lenders who are sharing, again, the score they're using for risk management with the consumer. So it's a very nice, tight fit there between the score that's used for risk management and the score that the consumer then, then sees, because there are different FICO score versions and other versions that, that lenders use. Um, and we do see um, higher higher scores for people who are engaged with these programs, also lower delinquency, and there's a benefit of, of additional uh, of lower attrition from the bank themselves. So they have a long a longer, more engaged uh, customer relationship as as well. And I I will just say you know we go through um, the the incredible work that that we we heard about in in supervision and enforcement, and and sometimes um, you know the the headlines of 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 the wrongdoing of of lenders and and and, and you know I, that that's incredibly important work and and that stuff should be rooted out and identified and, and corrected, but I I just want to take this this moment I mean these programs wouldn't happen at all without the commitment and and the embracing of of the nation's lenders and and in fact many of the lenders that are here and many of the nation's largest lenders and you know we work with you know hundreds and and thousands of lenders and we see a strong commitment even by some of the same organizations that are tripping up in other places, a strong commitment to, you know, consumer education and, and doing the right thing by consumers. And, you know, I just, I think it's important to make sure we, we keep that part in, in mind as we, as we balance some of the, the things we, we talked about this morning. Thank you. Jean, then Paulina. Yeah, uh, this is great work. Uh, it's so important for people to have access to the credit scores, but then to sort of echo Lisa's point, it's like, okay, so now I know what it is. How do I improve it, right? As we all know, there's a very vigorous sort of credit score repair industry out there that's in the business of charging consumers fees for what are often temporary improvements in their scores. So to the extent that we can, you can take this to the next step and give consumers three, four, five, you know, um, steps that you can take to improve the score on your own and maybe avoid paying fees for temporary services, I think would be very beneficial uh, to consumers. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work on this. On the check systems point, um, it really it would be interesting to think about this um, in this context because nobody knows to check, right, the check systems and they get tripped up in opening the bank accounts. I think that you can get one report a year, but you have to it, you know, mail in a request. And so it's just very difficult. And it's very difficult to dispute an inaccuracy. Um, and so, um, and, and for banking the unbanked, this would be extremely important. Um, and so just wanted to echo that um, in, as, in terms of a next step. Chris? So this is, I'm just gonna uh, echo the, the great work in that this is, a, I know this camera's right there. It's like, it's like the flower arrangement in the table. Um, <clears throat> this, is a, this is great work and certainly having access to credit scoring is really important. And uh, I think as you go through this process, one place that I might flag is, and, and you, it, it's referenced in the materials that there are different credit scores, and Jim and I have talked about this a little bit, that there are different credit scores for different products um, and that some providers are making them available, uh, but there are still, there are still opportunities to be surprised by a credit score and one place in particular that we've um, heard about it is in the auto space um, where there may be a significant difference between the credit score that you get from your bank or your credit card uh, and the auto score because they're looking at different variables there's different different ways that that those are calculated 
Um, and I think as a consumer, it would be very easily, easy to get frustrated and feeling like, especially if you had a relatively high, uh, high FICO score, but then the FICO auto score is significantly lower, which could you know, result in a very different interest rate, feeling like I did everything I needed to do. I looked at everything. I thought I was in good shape. I walked into the dealership and then I find out this. And so, you know, potentially helping folks to be able to see there are different things that I might have to do to affect that score. And it may be different than the general uh, advice that I'm getting about do these things and this will get better. Is there something I can actively do here? And so, um, you know, I applaud the work that you're doing and I think this will be important helping to figure out how to make it so that consumers don't just, you know, once they get all the information, then shut down because it is complicated and make sure they see that there's a path forward. Sylvia, then Judy. Again, I hate to be so repetitive, but I think all of us here at the table are so thankful because we've seen, we've been in the trenches and we've seen the, uh, travesties that have been done to consumers. So again, thank you. This is very timely. We have uh, two large classes, home buyer education classes this coming Saturday. So we will definitely share this information with them and go forward and share it with other organizations as well. My question is this, do we know which bureau they're actually pulling from when they give us the score? Is there a way to know? Because sometimes creditors will use one score uh, as opposed to another one, whether it's Experian or TransUnion. So to know where the, the, the source of the score comes from, I think is important. Do you know if that's, that's available? Yeah. Um, so it, with, with respect to the FICO score open access program, there are three variables that are important in defining the, the score. And that's the date that it's pulled, the bureau that it's pulled from, and the score version. As, as Chris points out, there are multiple versions of the FICO score. So at the score display, where we're displaying the three-digit number, from the very beginning, we require participating lenders to disclose those three things, the date it was pulled, the, the, the credit bureau that it was pulled from, and the version of the FICO score that, that is being used to generate that score. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Judy? So I, I'll just keep you know, pouring on the praise. This is wonderful. Um, I worked a lot with consumers. I wanted to echo some of the things that Lisa had said. Um, I worked with a lot of low-income consumers and helping them access their credit report. And, you know, 100% of the time after you pull their credit report, they say, so what's my score? And so I do think, um, and I think that this was mentioned earlier too, um, this is all wonderful and I'm glad for it, but we have to find a way to increase that access to low-income um, clients who don't have credit cards many of the times. And so, um, and I think, you know, Discover does, I believe, give you, a, or if you're non-customer, um, but I think that's still kind of confusing to people. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important is if we could come up with some quick little explanations of some common actions and how they affect your credit score. I'm, I'm annoyed, frustrated, angered, Almost every time I get into a more, I, I do facilitations and mortgage cases um, for the state of Indiana, and um, a consumer will tell me they want to do a deed in lieu because they were told by the servicer that that won't hurt their credit like a foreclosure will. Well, that's just a bold-faced lie. <laughs> and so I think if people knew what different actions, how they affected their credit scores, or not, if, if you're making a decision because you think it's doing X to your credit score and it's not, you know, that's a bad decision. Um, and so... You know, there are certain sort of common things um, like the different foreclosure methods, like whether you voluntarily turn your repossessed car in or not, or try to work out payments. You know, it's those kinds of things that it would be useful. I know that there are other variables that you can't say it's, you know, it's 2.8 points for everybody kind of thing, but you, you could at least know that these things are relatively the same. This one's a big hit. This one's a big improvement, that kind of thing. For, for the consumer education. And then my final thing to say is um, I did training for many, many, many caseworkers on the Money Your Goals and was horrified and shocked and upset at how little the case managers, financial trainers knew and understood about this particular issue. So that is a real area to, I mean, some of the things that they were asserting were just wrong. And, you know, obviously our training helped, but I think um, because the credit score was not a big part of that education piece, this you might want to sort of update on that.
Thank you. Jim, did you have something to put in? Yeah, I just have one quick one. This is a, this is kind of an interesting point that, that uh, Judith brought up in terms of, um, you know, how we communicate to consumers, and it kind of goes to the point made about uh, CROA and other other restrictions and kind of unintended consequences. Now, I'm I'm not an attorney, so if anybody wants more information on this, um, but there was a case that came out of the, I think the Ninth Circuit that um, forced that caused our legal group to change the text in our open access program. There's 180 million accounts now that are able to get their FICO score for free. And with that, you get your reason codes of why your score isn't perfect. So that's some indication. And we had text in that said, you know, actions you can take. I mean, you have, remember, in, in consumer behavioral, you have just a moment in time to make that impression, especially for people who are not, you know, they're, they're busy. And you know you there you know you just have a, a, a very brief moment in time to make an impression and hope you ca capture something and educate them, and because of this ruling and because of we we had to kind of water down you know the the, the text literally like actions you can take and we had to call it something else, which um, you know is I mean here we've got the nation's lenders trying to educate their consumers and um, you know there's this unintended consequence of can they trip over something um, in CROA a as they're doing it and, and so it's just those kinds of things we got to kind of be careful about because you know where 180 million people are getting their score for free we should just be um, as explicit and, and concise and, um, and, 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 and simple about what they need to do as we possibly can without fear of, of tripping over something. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jim. Kathleen? I have a, actually have a question for Jim and then a thought for Janneke and Maria. Um, but uh, before I say what they are, I feel like we are um, in, in a really sweet place as this, you know, this cab. You know, the, the first couple of rounds, or at least the first, uh, first round, they were all like having to, you know, muscle through regulatory proposals and all that kind of stuff. And we get to sit here and see how um, this agency has stood up and just made extraordinary progress in, a, in an area where, you know, the, those of us who are a little bit older have spent 20 years banging our heads against the wall. So it's just, it's, it's just I feel very happy, <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, so, um, Jim, my question for you is about the legacy versions of FICO and what impact they are having on, on credit scores and how old some of those legacy systems are? Well, this is a good this is a good question. Um, you know, this is this could be a very long answer, and I, I don't know if we have time to go through it at all. But um, you know, as Chris brought up earlier, we have multiple versions of the FICO score, and for very good reasons. So, in in the case of auto, what we're trying to do there is, as people prioritize their payments, and people have prioritized their auto payments in the past, we're trying to give them the best possible auto score. Um, and that's what happens in that auto version. It, it, it overweights kind of installment and auto loans in your past. And if you've managed those in a way that's favorable to you, you get a, a chance to get yourself a, a better auto score. And that's very important. Um, we also have prior versions. I mean, the good news, bad news is our, our scores aren't built for obsolescence. I mean, they are very robust and they don't break down over time. And in defense, and I know these scores are, it, it took five years for our FICO score eight, which was, we, we've now introduced FICO score nine. FICO score eight was by far a, a most predictive, they had a, a, a significant lift over prior versions. It took over five years for that to become 50% of the volume. And that's about where it sits today. It's only still, so that means about 50% is still in these, these older versions. And in, in defense of why that is, is the big leap in credit scoring from the same data came 27 years ago, we went from subjective lending and underwriting based on just the, you know, you talk about, Brian, looking at that report. Imagine trying to assess risk looking at that credit report. It's almost impossible. To break that down to a three-digit number based on statistically valid mathematics was a big breakthrough, and it, it, it made for much more objective lending. But that was a big leap forward, and it, and it, 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 it you know, it worked the Bureau, the, the work that the bureaus did to organize the data with the FICO score has provided for the broadest distribution of, of, of credit anywhere in the world. I mean, that's the fact. Um, every version since then, frankly, I mean, has been very incremental. Um, and the cost of replacing it is, is substantial. 
And so that's that's kind of the dilemma for an organization that's that's running and deeply embedded the score. Um, there's regulatory risk. There's these are highly scalable, very automated systems. Um, they, and they touch multiple facets, the, the reason codes for adverse action notices. So it's, there's a lot of that go into it. And then think about the ecosystems around mortgage and, and auto where it's not just a, an issuer, but you've got all these other stakeholders that are consuming these scores. So that's, you know, that's the problem. And I guess that's why these scores are, are still in, you know, in, in place. Now, with that being said, like our FICO score 9, you know, treats medical collections differently. And that's, again, because, and again, all due credit to the bureaus, they now have differentiated in the bureau record medical collections versus non-medical collections. And with that, we can do the research to show that medical collections are less predictive and we can weight those lower. And that's a big benefit then to people who have medical collections. But now you have to adopt, we can't go back and, and change those prior scores. I mean, again, you, the, 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 the new score now is FICO score 9. And the only way to get that new algorithm is in place is go to the work of, of validating it and then implementing that, taking out the old one and implementing the new one. And so with, if, if a paid medical collection is your only negative item, so you've got, you, you haven't had any delinquencies or any other things, a, a paid medical collection is on your, on your file, your FICO score 9 could be 100 points higher than past versions, say FICO score 8. So I've got a 100-point difference between my highest and lowest FICO score. My FICO auto score 2 is 100 points lower than my FICO bank card 8. Um, and so it is important to know which version you're using. And that's why through our open access program, we require the lenders to prominently display the version of the FICO score that they're using for your, to manage your accounts and then there is, 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 is being displayed to you as a, as a consumer. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, uh, it's interesting that you picked medical debt because that's exactly what I was thinking about, was how the legacy versions are still treating medical debt like other types of consumer debt. Um, and I think that's really problematic. Um, but as I understand what you're saying, the bureaus are kind of backing that out now? Well, there's a couple things going on. So yes, there's, uh, I think they, there, there's like a 180 day kind of moratorium before it flows in. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, it's, it's then included in, in the file and the FICO score nine will then weight that, weight that lower. Oh, okay, that but the, okay, all right, I understand. Um, so that, and, and it's probably, the, the le legacy versions are gonna be around for a while. So this is gonna persist. Okay. Um, so my, my thought, um, and um, I really got the idea from Brian Hughes, so I, I want to give him credit, is thinking about ways to link um, what's happening in one area, say the free credit reports, or credit scores, I'm sorry, to the CFPB resources. Because I think there continues to be a problem of people not understanding what a wealth of help exists or has been developed by this building. And I'm wondering if it would be possible to have some kind of link or I don't know the right technical term, advertisement saying, you know, if, um, if you wanna understand how to fix your um, errors on your credit score or, you know, go to the CFPB, you know, there you could get help, fix, information on how to fix your errors, um, how to repair credit. Um, maybe have a link on there to your annual free credit report because that if we have all these different customers who are going and you see the on the websites at least to discover the um, the free uh, credit score pretty prominently once you once you get on there then you, then you you're channeling people to your information um, so that's just a thought if it's possible I don't know if the, how the banks would feel about it but thanks Kathleen we got Jim Chi-Chi, and then Neil. Thanks for the, the good work you've, you've done on, in this area and consumer empowerment. I appreciate it. The, um, I wanted to switch for a quick moment. I'll just give you my conclusion and explain why I reached it. And my conclusion, my point is that I, I would hope building on this good work uh, that I would characterize as being related to empowering consumers with, re, with, re, with credit reporting information primarily related to debt or lending access, I would encourage uh, um, the Bureau to be open to continued work that would go beyond what's been done and to empower consumers with a greater ability for the benefit of both consumers and businesses 
to uh, stop the continued growth in identity theft. And contrary to popular belief, the average victim of identity theft does pay an out-of-pocket amount. People say the average loss is zero. It's absolutely not true. Reliable data show that. Data breaches are up. Identity theft victimization is up on a national basis. And I think the, uh, uh, a couple of things that, that I think are important, I have a slightly different view on the value of some of these um, sold services, credit re reporting information. I do think they have value. Um, I, I know they cost a lot of money. But if we look at um, just a, kind of a personal example, recently I bought a car. I'm sitting there. I'm, having to, I'm giving somebody a check in a weekend. They run my credit report. And um, I had two, because I'm, I work in this business, I have two separate services. I get credit reporting information. Uh, one of the Bureau services didn't give me an update until three days later. If I was a fraudster making that purchase in my name, I never would have known until after the fraud would have happened. Another service did give me notice, so it's not enough to necessarily have one service. And many of the services, the periodic services that are available for free, don't provide real-time information. Uh, when we, if we, no, so I'll just keep it there for the sake of time. I think it's important to consider the real-time value of credit reporting information from multiple bureaus to stop the rising tide of identity theft and go against the, uh, the rising problem of data breaches. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to respond to a bunch of the um, points that have been uh, made earlier. You know, with respect to um, legacy versions of FICO, I mean, we're big fans of FICO 09, huge fans, and we think everyone should be using FICO 09. And in fact, a couple of years ago, um, we sent a letter to um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, FHA, because um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, require the use of older versions of FICO. Um, that do consider m medical debt, and um, uh, here we are two years later, and I don't know uh, if um, we've gotten any uh, movement on that. I know there was some movement toward it, but anything official. Um, but, you know, it, it, it should have been used a long time ago. Um, and to, to acknowledge that the, the FICO's competitor also similarly treats medical debt vantage score. Um, but, you know, uh, any any um, lender who's uh, listening right now, please switch to FICO 09. Um, on um, the the Credit Repair Organizations Act point, um, uh, you know, um, I, I personally don't think um, CRO is should be a problem because you guys don't charge for um, open access. Um, uh, but m what I'm more worried about is there is a bill um, being pushed by one of the big three credit reporting agencies to exempt um, credit reporting agencies from CROA wholesale, um, including prohibi prohibitions on deception. Um, and I think it, it goes over broad. And it, th there's been a similar argument used that, you know, we, the credit reporting agencies, can't um, help people improve their credit. And that I think the only barrier is that they, they want to charge for that, and um, they can't charge ahead of time. Um, and so uh, we are very much opposed to that particular bill. Um, and then on the last point on identity theft, um, part of the reason I, I um, question or criticize um, these credit monitoring products because um, they're not as effective as the single most effective measure against identity theft, and that's a security freeze, which it does cost money. It just it's not a subscription product; it's a one-time fee. That is the most single. I mean, it's it's closing the door before the horse gets out of the barn. The rest of them are detecting when the horse has left the barn. And so um, to the extent that anybody's paying anything to prevent identity theft, it should be a security freeze. And we've been, you know, we would encourage the Bureau to um, emphasize that those are the most effective measure. Neil, you'll get the last word. Sure. I don't know if this is a question for Jim or for Yannicka, but, you know, just listening to the discussion about uh, auto versus credit card scores and stuff like that, do you have any opinion or what's your thinking about the correlation of FICO to some custom scores that individual lenders might use? And is that a source of potential consumer confusion in terms of credit, you know, access to credit? Well, I, I mean, we'll let the lenders speak for themselves, but I mean, we've always recognized that the FICO score is one factor among many, and many times we'll ride along with a, with a custom model and, you know, the, the information coming from the application, and, I, you know, I think you'll see that this is explained to consumers that the FICO score isn't the only, the only factor used 
um, and that there, there are other factors I involved. We are going to wrap. I will I kick in my two cents before we do just on that last one. The consumers I talk to are utterly confused. They really, it's, it's wonderful. I love this. I love the CFPB's educational materials just generally. And I love that you produce something regarding the fact that there are different scores um, because nobody gets it. So I've talked to people who are con convinced that there's one particular magic number that should be their target number who are firmly convinced and nothing could sway them from that. Uh, and others who realize, oh, well, I actually, I really don't know. What is it and why am I getting a different score for different purposes? So somehow to be able to iron, I know it's a process, to be able to, seems like somewhere between providing more information about what the different purposes are for the different scores, uh, that would be I ideal um, and could have, uh, effectuate some positive uh, behavior modification for consumers as well if they know that they're going to be rewarded for certain types of behavior um, versus uh, others. Um, and perhaps that might be also part of continuing that good work that you're doing of unpacking information for consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Steph, for for Yannicka and Maria for um, coming here and providing this great information and for the great work that you're doing every day. Um, thank you, CAB members, for your engaged um, and intelligent comments um, and helpful comments. We're going to take our break now. Thank you to the public as well. We've learned a good deal this morning. We're going to break for lunch and resume the meeting later this afternoon at 2.30 p.m. Thank you.